Zach Evans, he looks healthy. Healthy indeed, and he stays in bounds, and he's still on his feet. Evans takes it inside the 35. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. Dracovic trying to go downfield, though. There's Zay at the 10. Inside the 5, he'll score once again. 365 Sports is presented by IdealMRI.com. High-quality MRIs for $497 or less. IdealMRI.com. Your health is important. So is your budget. Pressure gets there, and it is Isaiah Foskey getting a sack. Justin Tuck's record is in trouble. Here comes Isaiah Foskey. 365 Sports is also brought to you by Texas Farm Bureau Insurance, protecting Texans since 1952. Tulane rushes three, probably in trouble. Moving to his right, now he takes off, and he's dragged down by Dorian Williams. Tulane takes over on downs. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Search 365 Sports on YouTube. Brought to you by TFNB, your bank for life. Third and three, two, corner, open, caught, tank, Dell, touchdown. Now here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. Good afternoon, 365 Sports. Hope you've stayed Warm and dry. Some of you have still been hammered with all the icy conditions and snow, whatever else. Today it's just been cold, blustery. Rained a lot this morning here in Waco and Central Texas. But here we are, 365 Sports. Today Garrett Ross runs the mothership as he does most of the time. Craig Smoke, Paul Catalina, I'm David Smoke, and thank you for giving us your time today. So here are a couple of notes. Texas A&M. If you look at really, despite a lot of what they have lost, if you look at who they have coming back on offense, Anaya Smith, who last year had a huge game early against Sam Houston State, a couple of touchdowns and 160-plus yards receiving, then got hurt in the game against Arkansas, and then he was done. They lost Devin A. Chain, who was their motor, no question. But this guy here is a hell of a player, and AM slowly but surely seemed like they still have quite a bit of starters back, despite a lot of those who have entered the transfer portal or who are no longer with the team. This is good news for them, and they haven't had a lot of great news. Yeah, I think he was uh, – I, I don't know where with the NFL draft deadline was a, was a couple weeks ago, uh, obviously, and, and that's why I was kind of surprised to see this now. I kind of assumed that he was going to just, you know – do it because he he had such a severe injury uh, last year, but um, coming back might be the best thing for him to to show what he can do and add into that offense that already has uh, Moose Muhammad and uh, and Evan Stewart in it. So that's three good wide receivers uh, for Connor Wigman to move on with. Uh, curious to see what happens with the running game if that's you know Ruben Owen's job to lose right now or who on the roster takes over for Devin A. Chain. Uh, they A and M was was proceeding probably all year long that they were going to have Anaya Smith and Devin A. Chain this year uh, anyway is with the, the way they went by it. But this is a huge get, especially if he's healthy and can start to regain some of that form that he had because he was an electric, electric playmaker. Yeah, I mean, that's big news. Uh, I, I don't know. It's too terribly surprising considering he played in four games last year. I mean, he didn't he didn't do anything. He he got injured early in sept or late September, I guess it would have been, but early in the season and and we didn't see him after that. So, you know, he he needed to recover and uh, you know, I don't know what his draft evaluation would have been at that point in time. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't really matter now at this point. I mean, he's he's back in college station and so yeah, for an you know, an, a a program that has had an off season that's certainly had twists and turns, uh, lots of twists, uh, probably far too many turns uh, for most people's liking. Uh, I know that's just kind of how a and you know, is sometimes. There's just, you know, just craziness going on. But um, that was a little more than even I think anybody was accustomed to. And just you had to wonder, like, okay, what exactly is going on here? Like, what – does Jimbo have control of this thing? Is there still confidence in him? Like, what are we doing exactly? 
And so, uh, yeah, it's good to see, you know, the opposite of all the other moves that we saw early on. It's good to see that they've basically grabbed control of the steering wheel and they've got control once again, and they're back on track, uh, it would appear. So, yeah, I mean, they're never not going to have talent, but they certainly had an exodus of talent that was expected to contribute for the next, you know, two, three, four years for them. Um, so to have a guy who's pretty proven and that you know can really do some good things for you uh, coming back is, is a big deal for them. So, yeah, add in uh, Muhammad and, you know, Evan Stewart and need to figure out some other areas. But, uh, I, you know, they're, they're an interesting team, and uh, this obviously makes them a little bit more interesting. Evan Stewart uh, is, uh, is a heck of a player, but Muhammad made some plays near the end of the year that you could just see, of course, the lineage with his father, a longtime player in the NFL so that's news for A&M, and they have not had, again, what seemed like a lot of it. And, and some of the guys who left, by the way, they weren't being asked to come back. Right. So the transfer portal was also part of you're going to leave anyway. That's fine, but you have to transfer, yeah. transfer. Everybody's, you know, portal story is different, uh, and, and you don't really know how badly it'll affect the team until much later on, especially for guys who were, were true freshmen uh, a year ago. Um, but – with Anaya Smith coming back, it gives them three wide receivers with three different skill sets. Uh, and you thought AM's offense was bad, you know, in the first few weeks where they struggled to score. Uh, it got really bad when he wasn't there. Because How about the fact that he was their third leading receiver and he played in four games. Yeah, exactly. So that's that, garbage. Yeah. They third leading receiver, he played in four games. Also, he's the guy that they did. I mean, a chain too, but he was their kind of jackknife of like, here's what we're going to do, something special, just to get the ball in a super athlete's hands. All the creativity in their offense essentially went out the door when Anaya Smith got hurt. All right, so there's that story. Now, Alabama's looking for a new offensive coordinator. Chris Lowe of ESPN and others have put this out. In fact, one of our great friends on the text line, also Michael Campbell, Notre Dame's offensive coordinator, Tommy Reese, has emerged, according to Chris Lowe, as the top target for the offensive coordinator's job under Nick Saban. He's had discussions with Saban, scheduled to be on campus today, uh, or perhaps was on campus today, as he looks, Saban does, to replace Bill O'Brien, who's back in the NFL with the New England Patriots. I looked at this tweet and then looked at some of the responses. And like you get with almost any type of coach, you get a little bit of both. You get a little bit of that. That's kind of an intriguing deal and a hell of a deal for Reese to go learn under uh, and coach under Saban. And then there were some like, well, that meant Alabama football's dead. You know, because I, I don't know. I don't know that much about him. I just know of him and the fact he's been at Notre Dame. Okay. Uh, and just, just reading this on The Athletic uh, brought up a good point. Brian Dayball had a history with uh, Nick Saban. He's one of their last five – offensive coordinators but everybody else when you talk about Sarkeesian Bill O'Brien um, you know whoever else it's been there for the last five have been the reclamation projects the Nick Saban you know uh, school for wayward coaches and this is not in any way that this is an up-and-comer Tommy Reese is 30 years old he's a young coach with um, you know that, that maybe brings a little di different look and some offensive innovation uh, to it so uh, yeah, kind of the exact opposite of, of Bill O'Brien as far as experience goes. Uh, so, and then obviously going after Grubbs uh, from Washington as well. Uh, Nick Saban is, again, uh, you can say a lot about him. He is not set in his ways. Uh, he, is, he is always willing to adapt and maybe felt that, especially going into a, a year where the, the most uncertain position on the roster right now is probably corner or cornerback, quarterback. Um, you know, might as well get somebody in there with some new fresh ideas uh, because this is the first time in a few years where you don't really know exactly what Bama's going to have a quarterback. You can trust that, you know, they probably have a lot of really good talent on, on the roster, but, you know, who's ready is Jaden Milrow the guy, Jalen, is Jaden or Jalen? Jalen. Jalen Milrow the guy, uh, and I, I, they, they want to have a, a new look. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, let's see if it becomes official because, you know, we, there's plenty of guys to speculate over. Um, and so any, you know, hand-wringing or hair-pulling might not even be necessary on the part of Alabama fans. But, I mean, you know, all due respect, you don't know you know who's on the other side of that keyboard who's, who's maybe just constantly bitching no matter who it is. You know what I mean? So, yeah, um, I can see where that wouldn't be the most popular decision uh, necessarily. I mean, the last time I remember really seeing anything about Tommy Reese, he was flipping out in the Notre Dame uh, was the, the press box <laughs> like early in the season. Y'all remember that clip that yep. went viral? Yep. Just losing his mind talking to his quarterback on the sideline. And uh, 
Um, yeah, that was really, I feel like he kind of just faded away after that. Like, probably got, like, I probably just need to step back a little bit. But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously Notre Dame went on to have a good season, and uh, he got the most out of the talent that they had. Uh, you know, there's the school of thought that give him the Alabama level of talent and see what he can do with that. And I think that applies to the defensive side as well. Um, yeah, not necessarily the first name that would pop in mind and, and not sure how much of a you know difference you'd be looking at uh, Alabama-wise, you know, in terms of what they do offensively. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, is that uh, the fans aren't always right. At the same time, Nick Saban's had a pretty good track record, but he's not always right either. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's a very interesting name and, and kind of see why it would be polarizing because – um, you know, it's, it's got some name value, and he's done some good things. But I, I think at Alabama, your expectations are just so daggum high, though. You know what I mean? Like, you're just, you just had Bill O'Brien, who's like an NFL head coach, and you, you didn't care about him at all. You're like, yeah, go away. Uh, and here he is, and he's, you know, uh, obviously one of the more well-respected guys, and he's, he's going to the Patriots again. So he doesn't not know football. <laughs> you know, he doesn't not know football, but you'd have thought he was the worst coordinator in America based off the last couple of years. So, yeah, um, I, you know, polarizing name, interesting name. Uh, he's not the only name. I mean, there's Joe Moorhead I think they talked to as well. You mentioned Grubb as, as well. And, and so, yeah, this is, uh, this is hitting on a lot of different uh, places and a lot of different uh, coordinators, and I'll be very curious to see who ultimately emerges. Reese was a quarterback at Notre Dame. He coached for a little bit as a grad assistant at Northwestern. San Diego Chargers offensive assistant has been at Notre Dame since 17, the last – two years, three years actually, as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. Doug Nussmeyer, he was just recently fired by the Cowboys when they decided to go in a different direction with Kellen Moore now, who was with the L.A. Chargers. Doug Nussmeyer, who's been the Cowboys quarterbacks coach and has a long time, you know, a, a resume from a lot of places, is one of the leading target or candidates now to become the offensive coordinator for Mario Cristobal and Miami. So, Kellen Moore, gone, immediately picked up by the Chargers. Nuss Meyer's got a pretty good track record. I mean, what he may have done, not so much. I know there's always the polarizing comment cop topic about Dak. What did he do when it came to when Dak was out and the kind of work that they had done from a guy that most people don't even know? Oh, uh, yeah, I think I think Doug Nussmeyer did a fantastic job with Dak and with, with especially with Cooper Rush, my, my goodness. But, um, yeah, and I think that the college offensive coordinator, he's been kind of both jobs. He's, he's, got, he's a guy who can kind of walk between the NFL and college as he wants because he's got that street cred. Um, you know, his, his son is, is, you know, the one of the quarterbacks at, at LSU right now, and I'm curious to see if he does take the Miami job and Miami – kind of flails at quarterback after the spring if Garrett Nussmeyer doesn't say, you know what, I'm just going to go hang out with Dad and Mario down to Miami um, because he's not going to play this year more than likely because of, of Daniels there uh, that played so well last year. So um, I think that could be a twofer. Uh, he, he's got NFL and college background, most recently, of course, with the Cowboys the last four to five years. It was the Rams uh, about 15 or 16 years ago. Michigan State, Washington, Alabama, when Saban was there, Michigan, Florida. So he's been with some dogs now as far as some of the Blue Bloods. And, of course, he played uh, or as a coach in the CFL a little bit too. But, uh, you know, he played in the NFL, played at uh, Idaho, and so his name has come up at least in Miami. Um, yeah, let's put it this way. He's also talking with the Ravens, apparently, about their offensive coordinator job. Um, so the guy's looking for a job. Um, but, you know, you mentioned all his places. It's great. He's been at big schools. He's there for two years, two years, three years, two years, two years. You know, it's like very short, quick stops. And, I, you know, obviously a guy who's very well respected, but Florida fans – uh, or excuse me, Miami fans are under the impression this is a red herring. I've seen, you know, like they don't believe that this is actually the choice. Like yeah. there, there's om overwhelmingly, when I looked at this earlier, they're like, this has got to be a joke. This has got to be a distract or red hair. This has got to be, you know, uh, covering for some other direction we're going. They don't believe that he's a legit candidate, it seems like. But no, I mean, he's got a, an impressive resume. And you mentioned, I mean, that's where my thought, my thought actually went to his son before it really went to, to him and how impactful he would be in Miami of like, oh yeah, I wonder how that would, maybe eventually work for them but yeah it's an interesting name a guy who's been a lot of places and has you know coached a lot of stars over the years uh doesn't seem like it's really you know getting the Miami fans at least that I've seen and just kind of searching through doesn't seem to be getting them too excited but it could be you know uh 
a cover for somebody else, or he could end up in Baltimore, or he could end up for whatever else other job he may be, you know, talking with or about. So, yeah, uh, interesting name and uh, potential fit, and we'll see what happens. In uh, 2012, when he was the offensive coordinator with Kirby Smart, the defensive coordinator, and, of course, Nick Saban at Alabama, they won the national title. He was the offensive coordinator. They were 13-1, and beat Georgia in the SEC championship game. That was Georgia when they were starting to percolate again. And then, of course, hammered Notre Dame in the national championship game. So he has been places where they have won. And, again, you look at where he's been, yes, one or two years or so, but everyone who hired him, I wouldn't think that too many of those schools, Florida, Michigan, Alabama, Washington, those guys have had – I didn't look at his record, but I did look at 2012, just curious, and he was a part of a well, national championship I, team. I, I don't think – here's the thing about Doug Nussmeyer. Outside of it got, not getting his contract renewed with the Cowboys, which, um, you know, you could read into that a lot of different ways. I, I think if you look at what the Cowboys' actual offensive production was this year, this is more of just a – they need something different and not any kind of indictment of, of what Doug Nussmeyer was doing. But most of the places you've mentioned, uh, when he's left, he's left of his own accord. It's not – or he's been asked to come somewhere else. It's not like he's been – fired anywhere so I would love to have Doug Nussmeyer on the staff of any of the teams uh, that, that I was a fan of um, so if you're out there and, and Doug Nussmeyer comes to your team I do think though Craig what Miami fans want is Scott Frost I think that's what they they really? think they're going to get I think that they've they decided that because he had a great he recruited well in his short time at UCF which is obviously in the same state uh, and he he and his family liked living in Florida that the Miami job would would be attractive to to him and he could come in and and kind of reboot the career there plus uh, Oregon he and Mario Cristobal you know I think the chips passing in the night essentially but there might be that connection there so we'll see about Scott Frost but I don't um, I don't know about that. You know, we, we don't, haven't heard anything from Scott Frost or anybody interested in him um, at all uh, since he, he left Nebraska because he can, he can just sit on his buyout and not do anything, or he can go work somewhere else. Mac Brown has signed a one-year extension, North Carolina football coach. He, uh, of course, took uh, North Carolina to the championship game in the ACC. 30-22 and 22 in four years has kind of given them a little oomph. The expectations entering 2021 were huge. It didn't work out this year. They bounced back, had a pretty good run, had a couple of nice wins. Uh, and, of course, Drake May coming back for 2023. Expectations will be high. His extension now runs through 2027. He's been coaching a long, long time. And, you know, we had him on even during the time he was in between Texas and then North Carolina. He was working for ESPN. You could always tell that, it, that was he wanted that one more shot as most do. And, of course, he's had great success when he was at UT, and now he's doing pretty well trying to get North Carolina to the next level in the ACC. And now with Clemson, and now here comes Florida State, we'll see if that works out. Time to put Mac on retirement watch, uh, wherever Drake May leaves probably. So after next year, yeah, I mean, you know, the fact that he signed a one-year extension, um, the fact that he's getting up there in age at this point, the fact he's already been retired before and decided to come back, yeah, it just feels like, you know, let's let's squeeze what we can out of this, you know, great quarterback and, and what all we surround him with, and, and let's see where we can take this thing after, you know, getting close to a championship last year. But, I mean, it, it's got to happen just naturally. It has to happen at some point. So now that we're in one-year extension territory, yeah, it you know, at any given moment, like this season could be Mac Brown's less, last season. That's That's, you know. Uh, easy to, to think so if you're a Mac Brown fan or you just respect what he's done and I certainly respect what he's done over the years then you know take advantage because this could be his his last year and certainly could be Drake May's last year at North Carolina so it should be a big hyped up and expectations filled season I would think for Tar Heels fans out there yeah hey, uh, Garrett go to the th I look like I'm demonized no I you're I don't bright. think it's that yeah uh, I think is it the contrast uh, Katie Rader just said uh, Smokey's shirt is all, in capital letters, blown out, contrast, et cetera, on the video. You might take a look. I saw that earlier, and I feel like I'm perhaps – I don't know if, if that even shows up as the highlighter Ooh, yellow, hello. like an old – Baylor men's basketball jersey or it's not. It's like white and then like some vague lime around the neck. There yeah, you there go. You go. Okay. It, it looks on. like I'm like – <laughs> remember the old Chiron the weather people would get in front of the blue – the blue yeah. wall. No, I've got it. Garrett, I'm going to send you a picture <laughs> from a movie. I don't, it's not very big. Oh, man. So, uh, thank you, Katie Rader. Appreciate that. I 
this is kind of comfortable for how cold it is, but it, it's, it's not a really thick by any means shirt, but it's, it's very comfortable. All right, the East-West Shrine game is tonight. Connor Galvin, former Baylor offensive lineman, is a part of that. I did something because National Signing Day yesterday, although there'll still be some trickle-down effect as far as the signings of the class of 2023. We know that. We went over that. Craig had the numbers, and we kind of gave you the, the top five or ten and then a few others as well in the Big 12. The ESPN 2024, it's early. These are the class of 2024. The top player in the country, at least for now, is the young man from Pinnacle High School in Phoenix, which is Dylan Raiola. He was the one committed to Ohio State. Uh, his father, of course, a longtime NFL player, played at Nebraska. He's the number one player. Here's what I did do. And Micah Hudson, who plays about, what, an hour, not even an hour 45 from here, minutes, yeah. 45 minutes from here, the wide receiver from Lake Belton, Lake Belton had a couple of names on this list, is the 16th highest rated player here locally in the greater Central Texas area. Kobe Black from Conley, which is eight minutes from our studio, he's 34th in the country. Coppers Cove has a, a, a lineman who's 63rd. And then Lake Belton also has a guy, I, never, I didn't know much about him, Selman Bridges, the cornerback. Uh, he's 141st among those are local along with the ESPN's top 300 at least for right now. That's surprising you had heard it's about Selman Bridges because yeah, he's at Ohio State and everybody else rolling through here. With his um, teammate, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's a big part of the reason why, like, every school in the country has basically been to Lake Belton, and Micah Hudson is too. Like, they would have come from Micah Hudson, but they're definitely – I mean, Nick Saban was at Lake Belton the other day, if that tells you anything. So, yeah. He's Brian Cope's been busy, yeah, the head coach. Yeah, anything on that, Garrett? Oh, I thought you were going to oh, say I, something. I was just saying, like, I, covering Selman, he, he's one that's really developed because last year, uh, the, the year before last, he was kind of trying to find himself. I thought he needed to be more aggressive, and he kind of turned the corner that, uh, um, this past season, and that's really what's drawn in the offers. But he's rangy. He's like 6'3", 6 6'4". 6 and he's got a lot of room to grow, and he's got elite speed as well. Didn't they have a corner that signed with TCU? Uh, JV on Wilcox. Boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah was okay. He Baylor. was a Baylor commit. So I also did this because I was bored. Of the top 300, I started looking at who many, how many, who many, how many were in each state among these five. Georgia, 33. And again, this is early. This will change along the way. Alabama, 19. California, 24. And at least right now, Texas has 49 of the top 300. And there's a nice chunk here. It is a nice chunk also in East Texas, maybe more than a long time. And Florida with 41. So almost a 90 of the top 300 are from the states of Texas and Florida, which is kind of that trend we saw, and Georgia right behind them as the same trend we saw when we talked about that earlier in the week. We talked about that before. One of the comments we had on the video is that, um, uh, and I, I meant to send this to you guys, but was Georgia has passed California. And part of it is, uh, you know, the, the COVID year really hurt them as far as participation goes in mm -hmm. California. But it's been kind of a, a slower burn of that, you know, it's just not as popular a sport in that state anymore as it used to be. So it's still popular, but it's it's lost some some people, obviously, you know, medical concerns and things like that. California kind of reacts bigger to all those things than a lot of other states do. Uh, and Georgia um, is would give up oxygen before they gave up football. I mean, honestly, so uh, you've got you've got that, um, you know, coming up and it's really popular. And it's just again, like Atlanta's growing. So the areas around are growing, you know, constantly growing out so more and more people moving into that state so yeah you're going to have more talent over 150 half of the 300 are from texas florida georgia alabama and california and ohio didn't have many on this list at least when i was going through it earlier today but by the way smoky i found what you look like here you go this is what right. you're yeah there i am it's cocoon who is that? It's Cocoon. You're a Cocoon? I don't have any In idea. In the 80s where... The only Cocoon I know is the one that's got like the the the, the like the nest of the web. So in, in Cocoon, the aliens came down, and then they took like all the old people with them, like Wilford Brimley, and they went back to their planet at the end of the thing. But when the the old people like went around the aliens, they felt young again and, and all that, so... Jessica Tandy, Hume Cronin were in Cocoon. Does that cocoon, does it have blue eyes? Because I have blue eyes. If that's blue mm -hmm. eyes, then yeah. that might be me. But that, that, that does. That's eerily similar. 
that Katie brought that up on the shirt. I did not realize this was going to look like I had been electrocuted or just like well, I was a, you know, like a, a I don't know. Yeah. What, like a, what's the things at night when they, the bugs at night when they flicker? Lightning, lightning bugs. Lightning light, bugs. Yeah. Like a lightning <laughs> bug. Hey, we've got a $5 super chat from Ryan Nelson uh, on the ACC. Uh, no more divisions in the ACC. So much better. The Coastal was the Big Ten West of the ACC. Now we can get a, a Florida State Clemson ACC title game. Oh, would that it were. Well, I hope so. That might happen. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you're right. The divisions are something that everyone, not everyone, they're eventually going away as everything has increased along the way. And, Ryan, thank you very much for the $5 Super Chat. Yeah, I mean, they've done that in the Big 12 now the last couple, of, what, three or four years? And uh, I think it's worked out well. I mean, it doesn't make your schedule any easier. That's the thing is you run into a situation like TCU last year where you're having to play K-State twice. And, you know, fortunately for them, they had, you know, either built up such a lead being undefeated in the regular season or, you know, others weren't able to capitalize that they could lose that game and they, albeit, lost it closely and, you know, didn't suffer from it. But that could have knocked them out of the playoff in any other year. And that's the risk that you run. But, hey, if you win it, then you're you're no doubt, you know, you're in the playoff, um, you know, in, in a situation like TCU last year. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those where, you know, if it's the right matchup, you can lose a close one and still not get dinged too much. But had you, you know, been in a situation where it was like divisions and you lose a game like that and you might get dinged a lot more because you're not playing the second best team. You're playing what could be like the fourth best team in, in the conference. Uh, so, yeah, I, I like it. I like the games that it's created. It's created some really good contests in the Big 12. And, you know, it it's, makes it tougher, no doubt about it, because you're you're playing the second or first best team. And it also kind of sucks if you're TCU and you go unbeaten and you try to, you know, I don't. I haven't seen their fans try to do this, and it would be really. But the regular season title or whatever, it's like no, we don't do that in football. We we don't do that in football. But you know, it is a bummer to go unbeaten, beat every single team in that round robin, and then losing the championship game and not win the conference. But the ACC won't deal with that because they don't play round robin anyway. So you've always missed out on on playing other teams. But that was kind of the extra sting to to last year, I think, for the frogs. But yeah, uh, ACC fans should be excited. I think it'll make for some great contests. The top-rated player in Texas, going back to the ESPN Top 100, is Colin Simmons. We saw him. Midway last year was in the district with a different different district, but they were in the district with the Soto and Duncanville elite teams. And Colin Simmons, I remember him. He's the one that picked off a pass and ran it back for a touchdown, and Duncanville just hammered uh, Midway as they do most oh, everybody you, else. He's you, a you, defensive end, number seven, at least now, among the top 300 out of Duncanville. In that particular game, it's hard for me to remember specific yeah. touchdowns, considering that uh, that's all that Duncanville did. That's what they did the yeah. uh, uh, the uh, best sideline report in a bad game we ever got from Craig was uh, we were just he came on and did a report and said, "Guys, I don't I don't know if it, it's really playing up there in the booth, but I'm telling you down here on this side, this is bad. I mean, this like these oh, guys man. are getting beat up in a way that he'd never, I'd never yeah. seen before. Yeah, I mean, thanks for the super chat too, by the way, uh, from just a moment ago. But I mean, yeah, like I, you can try to put lipstick on a pig all you want to, but after a while, you just got to be honest about a situation when it's as ridiculous as that was. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you know? Let's. Let, I mean, I know there's a certain element of like showmanship and like things <laughs> yeah. like that but like come on i mean when you get down to a situation like the one like that was that was just they didn't even belong on the same field basically i mean they could have stopped and not played the fourth quarter you know i mean that and that's embarrassing for one side but that's just the truth too so um yeah duncanville is filthy loaded every year so is you know desoto and and they're always you know those two a part of you know some of the arguments about the best teams in the entire country but yeah you'd have to be more specific talking about certain guys because yeah against midway every single one of them did something of substance it felt like yeah, they're running backs among the top 300 who helped them win a state championship finally with reggie samples the head coach who had been on the cusp of it many different times beating north shore for the first time and it was a huge win scott drew will join us today at 5 30 they have texas tech on saturday coming off the loss monday to ut Paul's top five, Craig's off the radar. Also, Max Olson, theathletic.com on college football news, notes, nuggets, uh, transfer portal, uh, comings and goings. Of course, that's shut down for right now at 4 o'clock, and Mickey Spagnola on the Cowboys offseason that continues onward at 425. Don't forget at 1030 tonight on CW Channel Sports Tonight, Emory Winter will put 
what we have today from 3 to 6, condense it into that show on the CW channel. All right, when we come back, uh, well, I, there's a lot of you on the chat room. We're going to get to a lot of what you've been saying. Uh, right off the top, uh, again, Paxton was number one. He left us early yesterday. I mean, not like forever. He and Scotty B, one and two, and then S. Michael DeHart, Polo Bear, and T.J. Scott. We'll get to some of what you have to say. We appreciate your time. And this is 365 Sports. Pioneer Steel and Pipe, the new facility, more than twice the size of what they had before, and what they had before had helped them get through year after year since 1943 with their product and incredible unmatched customer service allows them now to carry new inventory higher quantities of inventory in a much more organized fashion in addition to their standard long lengths and tubing angles channels rods and also flat they now carry several shorter more convenient lengths of material already cut so that means that when you leave with the product you don't have to go somewhere else or have to worry about hauling longer pieces of material. The new 2,500 square foot showroom with over a thousand new products in stock, new welding supplies, hardware, do-it-yourself components for any project you have, whether you're a professional contractor or a weekend warrior. 1943, they opened their doors and they're bigger, better, faster, stronger than ever before. Pioneer Steel and Pipe just on the east side of I-35 in Waco on Loop 340 and Highway 6, PioneerBoys.com. The President's Day Sales Event is happening now at Allen Samuels in Waco. Shop the great selection of new cars, trucks, and SUVs and get amazing deals on new Ram trucks, Jeep SUVs, Chrysler sedans, and minivans, or a sporty Dodge. Get more for less, guaranteed, more value, more selection, more service, and more trade-in allowance. And of course, if we don't have exactly what you want in stock, we can help you build the custom car, truck, SUV, or van of your dreams and order it today. It's the President's Day Sales Event happening right now at Allen Samuels in Waco. Three Nations Brewing Company has 16 different beers on draft with a new beer every Friday. It also offers two air-conditioned tap rooms, a large indoor beer hall, a second-floor mezzanine offering a great overview of the brewing company and equipment and patio where you can relax under the shade. Plus, you can now experience the new Three Nations Beer Garden Grill on our shaded patio. Grab a cold beer and enjoy a bite from our freshly prepared and delicious menu. Street tacos, quesadillas, freshly cooked burgers and dogs, and veggie burgers, too. Nachos and and so much more all prepared and cooked on site. So come visit the award-winning Three Nations Brewing Company on East Vandergrift off I-35 in Carrollton. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be part of the Waco community. We're a small family business here in Central Texas. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. And that's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through this difficult time. So if you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. You can schedule online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or call 833-IDEAL-MRI. It takes time to reach goals. It's a truth that applies to more than sports. It goes for your financial goals as well. You work hard for your money and you deserve an investment strategy that lines up with your game plan. And Chuck Verno, your Edward Jones financial advisor can help. If financial investments aren't putting forth the effort you desire, stop by today for a financial review. Chuck Verno, 720 North 64th Street in Waco, 254-732-1161. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Automatic Chef Canteen is a full-service micro-market vending and office coffee provider with state-of-the-art vending equipment, a wide variety of products, and offering custom-fitted micro-market vending office coffee solutions for your employee break room. You want a full break room solution and a workplace oasis? Well, Automatic Chef Canteen, locally owned and operated for over 50 years in Central Texas, also includes in-house mechanics on call 24-7 for fast, reliable service and maintenance. Automatic Chef Canteen, 6900 Imperial Drive in Waco or online at automaticchefcanteen.com. 
TFNB Your Bank for Life is the official local bank of Baylor Athletics. Find out why more Central Texans are making TFNB their bank for life. Sign up for our Edge checking and savings accounts to earn interest or cash back with five convenient locations and an award-winning mobile app. Banking has never been easier. TFNB Your Bank for Life. Member FDIC. is 365 Sports. The 3 o'clock hour is sponsored by Waco Custom Marketplace. Meats, sweets, Texas treats, and a cut above the rest. 425 Lake Air Drive, Waco. TJ Scott, a lot of the ice. Uh, I am surrounded by tree limbs at my home in Austin, everywhere else. I saw some of the pictures. Even where near where I live, I saw where there were some tree limbs. That ice gets heavy, and it just snaps like a toothpick. Um, let's see, let's see here from, um, from Christian. What do you guys think about the big 12 meeting with presidents and ADs about Gonzaga? We brought that up as part of the itinerary or the agenda, uh, with Dennis Dodd and his story about Gonzaga, plus also still trying to find things out when it comes to whatever is the future, when it comes to UT and Oklahoma, that's what they're meeting for. They're up in Dallas and Fort Worth. And I, I don't know. I mean, your mark's trying to push the envelope and be different, be unique. And what are your thoughts about a team coming in? It would have to be for basketball only. They don't play football, but it would have to be, you would think, for men's basketball only. Yeah, for men's basketball only, look, it, it's already a great conference, and it's about to get better adding Houston into it. Um, you know, Cincinnati's got a pretty good basketball history. Uh, you know, UCF uh, and BYU are less known for that, but – um, but even still, like right now, you know, bringing Houston into the league, uh, when you're losing two good teams in Texas and, and OU, who are both really good and have really good coaches uh, right now in, in Porter Moser and Rodney Terry, yeah, you're going you're gonna to lose some of that juice um, basketball-wise. So adding in Houston and Gonzaga to replace them, to me, uh, is a great, great idea. I think it's more important, which also makes it a, a good deal to me for the Big 12, but uh, it's way more important for Gonzaga than it is the Big 12 to me because Gonzaga has been in the final a few times. They've been in the final four a bunch. They have not crossed over that hump, and lately it appears that their conference isn't doing them any favors and that they they rolled through a couple years without getting challenged, and then the minute they did, they weren't ready for it. And because they hadn't played, even though they had good wins in the non-conference, they hadn't played that consistently, so they got a little worn out. So I do think that with a coach like Mark Few, who who um, is is fantastic and and you know, probably top three in the country as far as um, it goes, coming into the league, that'd be great. I'm sure there'd be a little bit of struggle, but they could probably step in and compete right away you think about craig some of the other mid-majors some have survived going into bigger conferences some have not for example xavier fine villanova they were already a part of the greatness of the big east uh and, and then there are some other schools wichita state memphis and a couple of others creighton is fine some have and some have and i would think gonzaga would be fine I mean, you would think, but I don't know that there's any really guarantee. And, you know, does that stay the same once the coaching changes? I mean, is this just, you know, the magic of the Gonzaga brand that they're forever going to be great at basketball no matter what? And if they're not very good, how appealing is that? How appealing is that trip to the West Coast to go play Gonzaga in basketball if they're just another middle-of-the-road team or slightly above-average team in a league full of above-average teams? That would be my concern and why you need to think about it more than just like in the immediate of like right now. Yeah. Hey, that's great. It's like, it's like if the NSC are like, Hey, can we go get the chiefs and throw them in our, you know, like to have the best conference possible. Like that'd be great. And not saying that Gonzaga is a chiefs, but you know what I mean? Like go get some well, high level team and just add them. Yeah. On paper, it looks great, but there's also five, 10 years down the line. And I, I don't think Brett, your has got a 20 year plan. Cause I don't no. think any of us are stupid enough to believe that we're, everything's going to be the same that long but I mean it's definitely an interesting headline it's an interesting thought I, you know I don't know how many people put two and two together when they're talking about it when they think of like oh Gonzaga joining the Big 12 and and that it would offset somewhat the the losses of Oklahoma and Texas I mean you mentioned it but um, I think when it's mentioned you almost forget that Oklahoma and Texas are also leaving as well and so yeah to replace some of that firepower name wise basketball wise uh, they would certainly foot the bill I don't think the travel is probably as big of a deal as we make it out to be because in basketball, I think you're traveling pretty good a lot of the time anyways. You know, obviously, you wouldn't want to have to be West Virginia on a Monday night going you know, all the way out to play the Zags, but 
maybe that's high profile enough that it's like it's worth the trip because they, they would probably match them up with a two game stretch where they're on the road and then and then they come back for home. I mean probably but I'm just yeah. going through the different issues that you probably encounter yeah. so yeah I mean that wouldn't be like the reason you don't do it but I mean looking at why it makes sense or why it doesn't I mean yeah you have to at least look at the travel piece because they're out there by themselves although now the Big 12 has expanded so they have teams that make more sense uh, to to make those trips but um, yeah I I find it interesting. I'm not like a hard yes or a hard no on it, though. Like, if it doesn't happen, I won't bat an eye. If it does happen, I'll be open-minded and, and probably love it at first and, and you know, just be uh, ready to see how it goes. But it it's not it's not a scratch that – or it's not an itch that I feel has to be scratched. It's just – it's a luxury, if anything. Uh, your mark has said that they want to take the Big 12 in basketball, go international. Now, that's not international. That's just stretching it out to another, to another part of the country – you had mentioned, would anyone want to be there if there's a coaching change? I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Few looks like well, he might be there, well, Scott Drew. No, but I mean, one day he's going to retire. No, yeah, I right. mean, like that's the thing. It's like, so, like Craig said, it's not a, a, you know twenty years from now. Is it? A, if Mark Few is still coaching there twenty years from now, that'd be a, a little bit. I mean, that would maybe be the the length of which I would the maximum length I think he would. You know, because I mean, he's not young right i mean he's not old but like it's not like he's 41 he's 60 years old he's 60 yeah. years old so if he's going to coach till he's 80 you know that that's like shashevsky almost did yeah so like 20 years from now when mark few leaves hopefully it's if or not before does gonzaga fall off because they don't hire someone that can match that success we could say that about anybody it's true but in some cases even at schools who right. are part of the elite that's what but, i'm saying it's definitely a now move yeah like so absolutely. yeah that's fine but if you're sitting here looking at this as like some long-term investment like i said then yeah it's not necessarily one that you're like yeah let's let's invite them on a 20-year basis because he could retire in two years, and they could become irrelevant. And I know that they've got a long, lengthy history, but there's nothing's guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed. So, um, yeah, I think in the immediate future, if you're trying to make this like the International Basketball Conference or the National Basketball Conference and have as much reach as possible, then it makes a lot of sense. But I would do it on a probably a pretty short – I mean, look, and their, their next contract's probably going to be short-term anyway. So, um, I mean, if you want to just do it for this next go-round and – do it up to what 2030 30, whatever then um uh, then that would make sense and, and potentially be beneficial for you but it's an interesting idea i mean i appreciate the outside the box thinking and i'm not opposed to it at all but yeah that definitely uh your short-term uh interest would be would be uh, raised and you know i don't know how it would look long term we'll ask when we get him again and we will brett your mark right now again meetings earlier this week there was travel before the meetings because we reached out to the big 12 about what that does bring to the table and what is is that like step one of maybe four others a couple of notes um we went past twenty eight thousand subscribers and thank you kaizi or kaizo uh kaizi zoo for telling us that i didn't even notice that thank you very much we went over twenty eight thousand. we can't do it without everybody here all of you watching listening whoever's in the chat room are also who contact us in other ways, including the text line. Uh, let's see. Scotty B, it's rumored that the Pac-12 will get a seven-year, $25 million per team. I don't know the length. I don't know the numbers. We've discussed this now for months, really. But Steve Shook, who's uh, one of our great listeners, he's in Florida sometimes or he's in Ohio, mentioned, he goes, if you've been kind of paying attention, it doesn't look like the number – I don't know what number is going to be. I know this is like, oh, my God, if it's less than the Big 12, that's horrible. And if it's about the same, that's great. I don't know. I just hope that they eventually released it, and then you know the figures, and then you move on. I wish them the best. I don't want to see them fold. I know there's a lot of possibilities. If it's too low, then what is Oregon? What is Washington? What do they do? I don't know. But, uh, yeah, the rumored and speculation, we got to be careful with that, but Bob Thompson kind of explained a little bit of that with us when he was on a couple of weeks ago. I mean, we're definitely going to learn the numbers because those are going to eventually come out. So that's inevitable. But you know, I don't, I don't feel like this is the same conversation. And I'm not operating. I'm not. I'm not going to be one of these folks that pre that pretends to know like every little secret meeting that's going on. There are definitely people who have knowledge, and you can just on your own kind of sort through who's full of it and who's who's actually got some good sources. And it's all very interesting. Um, but I, I don't feel like just on the surface this is the same conversation as like a year ago. 
Kevin Warren's leaving. Yeah. Like, I think that matters. I, I don't think everything's just the same as it was when, when we were having basically these same conversations about Oregon and Washington a year ago. I think things have had to have changed uh, to, to some degree. Now, could the Big Ten still be super interested in bringing the Ducks and the Huskies? Uh, potentially. I mean, but I, I would also ask then, okay, well, well, then what about the Stanford piece? And what about the Cal piece? And what about the – like, it's not just like, oh, let's go grab Oregon, Washington, and we're, we're, we're moving on down the next aisle – I mean, it, it's not that cut and dry. Like, there's a lot of moving pieces there. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it's uh, it's very interesting, uh, just the, the whole realignment piece and the Pac-12 TV deal, the fact that it's taking so long, the fact that you had guys that were kind of talking trash in their headlines. And I know headline writers are headline writers and the authors of pieces are the authors of pieces, but there was some definite jabbing going on about the Big 12 deal and the Pac-12. Oh, we got Amazon and Apple, and there's the – all the alums in the West Coast and all that. And that was like six months ago. <laughs> that was like It has been since July, ago. USC, UCLA. Yeah, yeah like that. Was, all that talking. And like that was, we're, we're coming up on the one-year anniversary practically. Um, we're, I mean, we're as close to that as we are to, you know, the, the other side of it. But yeah, I mean, I think everybody's ready to just see it now. And I'm with you. Like, I'm not a part of all the P- Big 12, Pac-12 mudslinging. Like, I know there's different parties and some of that can be really fun and, and humorous and and then, you know, then I think ultimately everybody just wants everybody to survive, you know, but you want your side to survive better. And the Big 12 ha- has appeared, at least on the surface, to have looked like they positioned themselves better. Um, I know the, the argument will be, oh, well, they just took a lesser deal to have the, the first deal. But that might have been the brilliant move. That might have been the move that keeps them on both, you know, uh, uh, that keeps them on bigger networks in the long run and not as much reliant on streaming. So, yeah, I mean, at some point, the pack has got to get that deal done. Uh, but but going all the way back to the realignment piece, I, I just I need to see more from, like, actual, like, chatter than, um, than just rolling with the same story we had a few months ago as though Kevin Warren not leaving is not going to have any effect. Yeah. Uh, nor would he. And I don't know who told you this, who, who you read it from or what. He said something. I thought you couldn't recruit to Oklahoma. Oklahoma had a top 10 class, had a great run, had some good transfers, too. Uh, and I know that their season wasn't quite what everyone thought. It was kind of uh, really kind of upside down. Oklahoma has been recruiting well for as long as I can remember. It's a straw man. And they're man. now able, huh? It's a straw man. Yeah. It also, the fact that they're about to join the SEC doesn't hurt. Uh, they're going to recruit. They have as much history and lineage as any program in the history of no, college football. It, no, he also had a comment earlier, which I didn't address because I, I just thought it was silly. But to give context to what he's saying is, he says Lincoln Riley says you can't recruit to Oklahoma. That's up. not yeah, that. why Lincoln Riley yeah, left. No, no. Lincoln Riley left because USC bowled him over. And no offense to the folks in Norman, Oklahoma, but living in Orange County in a $9 million mansion for free maybe tips the scales a little bit than living there. Yeah, uh, yeah, I hear that. Like that's, and I, I, if you wouldn't have said the Lincoln Riley part, I was getting ready to follow up and say, like, the only reason that he could be possibly saying that, unless it was just a straw man argument, just to get people riled up, would be because of what Lincoln Riley said, or what Lincoln Riley appears to have said, or what his feelings are reported to have been. I, I think Lincoln Riley knows you can recruit to Oklahoma. I mean, there's guys in that USC roster, including the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, that he got to Norman, Oklahoma. Um, there's there's plenty of guys who have made that trek to go play for that program. I don't think that's much of an issue. But would you argue that it's perhaps a little easier at USC to go and do that? I, I think it's a little bit easier. I don't think that there's any great argument there. Uh, um, I think that, you know, if he was looking for the, the route better served for him to enjoy life and also recruit at that same level, if not higher, and probably do it a little bit easier just, you know, geographically, compared to where he was, then he's right. Um, But I don't think he ever said you can't recruit to Oklahoma. I just think he said it's way easier to do it over here with all of this stuff than it is to do it here the way we've been doing it. And and that's how I took it, at least. But I know that, um, you know, Oklahoma fans have probably read far more comments and and all of that. But that's always how I took it. I know know why the, the, the side they got broken up with will take everything a lot harsher. But I, I think he just is like, yeah, it's just easier to do it at USC than it is to do it at Oklahoma. Um, but, I, but I understand the, the angst there. All right, we told you about Ryan Nelson's, uh, his super chat, $5. Thank you very much. K 
King Williams 3D living in North Carolina. I can't tell you how much Coach Brown has done for not only UNC, but college football in this state. I'd hate to see him leave, honestly. Yeah, but he's getting to that point, remember, because of Texas, and he, he stayed in the game. Uh, he still has that oomph. It, but at the same time, you wonder how much longer he does. Uh, let's see. Austin, OU doesn't win all of them conference and natties without great recruiting. Oh, yeah. There you go. There's yeah. a great I mean, point. look at that. I, very, I think I saw point. a note the other night, uh, maybe last night, they have the most players in the Super Bowl. I think I saw that, mm -hmm. um, that they have the most alums that are in the Super Bowl. I mean, yeah, nobody's going to deny. I mean, put up any ranking of most current players or most, they're going to be in the top 10 to top 20 of pretty much any ranking, past or present, you put up in, you know, college football related. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's a name that sells itself. And it's not so much about Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, so, yeah, you're absolutely right in that regard. And, again, that's, that's how I took Riley's comments. Riley said, yeah, I could basically sit here and do this, and we could make the playoffs pretty much every year and win the Big 12 every year. Or I could go to Southern California and live close to the beach and live close to Hollywood and maybe just – I mean, like, I don't know. Like, I'd pick the same choice. <laughs> like, I would rather live in Southern California making millions of dollars and being able to afford the lifestyle – then have the same money and live in Norman, Oklahoma and whatever lifestyle that would be. No offense. It's just, it's better and, way of life. And Craig's arguably. a lifelong Oklahoma fan. Huh? Yeah, and you're a lifelong Oklahoma yeah, yeah. fan before some of you start getting your hair on the back of your neck all flared And up. I don't, like, bemoan and, and begrudge and, like, trash the state. I, I think there's beautiful parts of the state, and I'm not high maintenance, so I could live just about anywhere and be okay. But if I could have, like, my dream of where to live, give me millions of dollars, blank you money, to go get whatever I want in Southern California, yeah. that's an easy choice. That's an easy like, choice. And then if I'm a football coach and my job is recruiting, that's also an easy choice because as rich as the state of Texas is, and I know Oklahoma's a national brand, he doesn't have to go very far to get a lot of what he got at Oklahoma having to go all over the place. I, and so it just, it's just it's pretty simple when you look at it from that point of view. But like I said, as an Oklahoma fan, I understand why there is that that uh there with okay. Lincoln Riley. Could you live in California? I, it would, I, I, I know uh, what you're saying. Um, it's absolutely no, true. I'll tell you, Amanda is there right now, and she was they're going uh, to crew. They were driving to Laguna through Laguna Beach, and she's like, "I want to move here." And I was like, "Ah, you know, me personally, I don't know." But but for I'll nine million this, a year, for nine million a year, yeah. Yeah. plus yeah. plus and a, a house, a nine a million mansion. dollar house yeah. in Redondo Beach, in a helicopter, a, and. The use of the private jet for not just for recruiting trips, just to whenever me and the Riley family want to <laughs> jump in and go somewhere. Yes, I'm taking that job. Yeah. As Joey, a matter of fact, I'll let them sit in the room and insult me after every game I lose. Because why? I mean, what, what's the matter? Joey Foster, Super Chat. This is the best show on YouTube. Thank you. Smash the like button. We appreciate it. He also wanted to give us conversation about yesterday about West Virginia with the toughest schedule in the new Big 12 schedule. I agree we lose to Penn State. He said, I think we beat the four newcomers and go seven and five or eight and four. And Joey, I know you're a huge West Virginia fan. Appreciate you. Good luck with your schedule in the Mountaineers. Yeah, just one more thing on the Lincoln Riley thing. If you're paying me whatever thousand dollar and we're not getting lincoln riley money we're just getting average old person money then i'll live in oklahoma before i live in california <laughs> yeah absolutely but again if you're giving me blank you money where i don't have to worry about you know the the concerns of housing and all of that if that's pretty much just i can write a blank check then yeah there's there's no doubt there as far as west virginia goes i think that you're looking at it from you know the same vantage point as a lot of people or at least one of the angles that you're looking at is is the one that I think everybody's struggling with is what to expect in playing the four new schools. Because the school of thought is that they're all going to need some time to improve their rosters and their depth and just get used to the week in and week out grind. All due respect to the American Athletic Conference, but it is different when all of a sudden it's Texas and it's uh, Texas Tech and it's Baylor and it's OU and it's Oklahoma State and, and so on and so forth uh, versus, you know, Houston, Tulsa, Tulane, whatever, all due respect to those programs, there is a bit of a step up. And so I think, you know, to expect a little bit of a adjustment period based on history, based on TCU's having to adjust, based on West Virginia's having to adjust, based on that's just kind of been the way that it's been when you've, you've made that jump up. I think everybody who's been around in the Big 12 probably feels like we should win those games, right? But 
I don't think it's just that clear cut, and and I don't think anybody really believes that. And so it's it's hard to say like who do you think could be that team that you lose to, and who's the one that you feel super great about. And um, I think UCS the one that you got to be careful with right now, at least. I think they're probably the best in the best shape to to jump in next year. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a level of confidence, but. You can't get too overly confident and like, oh, these are three wins or, the, you know, these are automatic because nope. they might not be. We know? don't know. We really don't know. And uh, by the way, if you are one of the UCF fans and you were not able to catch our Gus Malzahn segment a couple of days ago, he, it is up on 365 Sports and all the various things we have that Emery and Jack and Garrett and others Jacob put up so you can go back and watch and listen as you want. We and have uh, Max Olson coming up here in a second. Joey, I hope you're right. I mean, I hope I hope that West Virginia does have a good year because they're due for it. Um, you know, I know last year was a struggle year prior. You know, so they've been through a lot of change, and I know it's getting really frustrating. I mean, the one thing you can basically be guaranteed is that, uh, barring some terrific year, there's probably a coaching search coming. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But, um, yeah, if you're right, then we'll be the first to give you credit for it. In my hand, uh, again, coming up next, Max Olson, TheAthletic.com. This is 365 Sports. In my hand is the latest edition of Cigar Aficionado. It actually features a lot of those on the Fox Sunday show in the studio with some Hall of Famers. And also the newest edition of the top 50 or 100 cigars in the world. Not the country, but the world. Rocky Patel 6060 is number two overall. The Oliva Siri 5, Churchill Extra is number five overall. And those two cigars, among others in the list or on the list, can be found at Don Chumador and Coffee Beans in the Townwood Shopping Center off Valley Mills in Waco. I was in there, uh, uh, I guess it was on Saturday of last week. I bought a brand new humidor for my cigars because something was going on and they found the latch in the back of the old one that was, the screw had gotten a little bit, I guess, out of whack. And so there was just enough to create a little bit of unstable with the cigars I had bought and they were new. So I bought a new humidor, they wiped it down, it's all ready to go. And while I was there, I saw the magazine, I said, let me have that. And I got it, and again, give you some of what they have inside of Cigar Aficionado, inside the 48-foot walk-in humidor at Don Humidor and Coffee Beans in the Townwood Shopping Center off Valley Mills in Waco. The future's bright, the time is now. College is what you make it. It's a late-night pizza run, and all-nighters coding a new project. It's having big dreams and making them a reality. It's a professor who knows your name and your story. It's preparation for your future, your calling, your life. And at Baylor, it's even more. We will a Baylor, where lights shine bright. Do you or your kids get nervous about going to the dentist? Stonewood Dental, Dr. Steve Childress, he can help. I've spent a career taking care of patients who as children had bad experiences, and now they're adults that hate going to the dentist. If I get a kid at three years old, and they come every six months, and it's a happy experience, it's normal for them. Now they have an accident at six or seven or eight at school. Now they have a broken tooth or a trauma, and they have to come here. They're used to lights, they're used to water in their mouth, they're used to experience, they already trust us. It's amazing what we can do with that kid without it being a negative thing. But if I see a six or seven or eight year old that's never been to the dentist, and now they have a trauma or an unfortunate, unexpected toothache, it's harder to do that for that kid and it not be somewhat of a negative experience. So bottom line is I try to teach kids and adults and teenagers and everybody the way I'd want my family treated, which is where it's a necessary part of life. You just take care of it. It doesn't have to be that big a deal. Learn more. Stonewood-Dental.com. In Texas, there's pea-sized hail and baseball-sized hail. Guess which one hit our house? We didn't even know where to begin, but we called our Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent, and he was so reassuring. He knew exactly what to do to get our house back into shape and our lives back to normal. Now, we're even more thankful for the roof over our heads. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Boots add protection. Good boots help you climb better and move forward faster. And when your son or daughter steps into the boots of a U.S. Army officer, they also learn how to lead. 
In these boots, they'll gain more confidence with expert training in one of more than 150 occupational specialties. In these boots, they'll stand a little taller and lead a team with diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise to successfully accomplish whatever challenge comes next. In these boots, they'll earn respect with valuable experience from day one that will give them solid footing for success into the future. Highly qualified candidates who earn a spot on our team can receive comprehensive health care coverage, college tuition assistance, and a bonus of up to $40,000. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. One size fits all. That may be all right for an adjustable belt or cheap sunglasses. But when it comes to your financial needs, no one wants a one size fits all strategy. Cam Heathcott, your Edward Jones financial advisor, knows that his most important goals are yours. That's why we take the time to understand your needs, knowing you. That's how Edward Jones makes sense of investing. Cam Heathcott in Conroe at 936-756-7717. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Welcome back to 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. It's time for our weekly segment with Max Olson of The Athletic, brought to you by Pioneer Steel and Pipe, where customer service is their main focus and best in metal, steel, and pipe for large or small projects, with two locations in Waco and Bryan, family-owned and operated since 1943. Max Olson, TheAthletic.com, decompressed last week. Why? Because the transfer portal closed. He has a life, too, although he does work his butt off with what he does in the transfer portal, college football, and much as a senior writer for TheAthletic.com. Did you just, like, put your phone up unless it was family calling? Did you just chill out? <laughs> I wish it was, like, a tropical vacation I could brag about. But, no, you guys know sometimes – you literally just need a couple of days at home to like do housework and things that you put <laughs> off the entire football season. Max, uh, Nicole Arbach had an interesting article. We discussed it yesterday. I think Ross also had one, a couple of other writers, about the NCAA looking at enforcing NIL violations. Do you feel like they really have a chance to do that? I, I think everyone is just, you know, especially you hear from coaches. I know Dana Holgerson spoke on it this week and others have. I think you, right now coaches are just very skeptical like I kind of I'll believe it when I see it when it comes to actual enforcement because as we've talked about before when I've been on like I, I just don't think anybody is like afraid of speeding right now because they're pretty sure they're not gonna get pulled over and you know I, I just don't think that um it, it with with how like how lax the uh you know the NIL rules were from the start and the way that you know as we've seen many times how long it actually takes to investigate and and punish a school um I, like you would assume people have been getting turned in for tampering and all sorts of stuff over the last couple of years. And you don't hear anything. You don't hear any, any cases or investigations or real progress or anything like that. So they're trying to lower the standard for, for themselves that it takes to go after a school. And uh, I think that just uh, has, a, has the potential to be a mess, but uh, certainly right now you, you've got like a mix of people who are just like, yeah, I'll believe when I see it. And you've got people who I think want to see there be punishment, but uh you know, don't really know what that looks like going forward here. Max, isn't there a fallacy in their argument of making the school prove it um, if they accuse them on conjecture because just because I can't prove it that you did also doesn't mean that I can't prove that I didn't. Much like if you believed in UFOs and I don't believe in UFOs, um, you can't prove to me 100% that they exist, nor can I prove to you 100% that they don't. And that seems to me like they'll wind up back in court. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I think you're, you're exactly right. Um, I think there's a real problem there. And, you know, also, especially when it comes to like the pay for pay play stuff that they, I, I'm sure are concerned about and are, are trying to target here. Like, can you really go after the schools if it's, you know, boosters or collectives that are doing contracts with student athletes? Like, I, not really, right? So, like, I just, I, I don't, you know, I, I've heard of cases of people being turned in for tampering and, and you know, oh, we've got them dead to rights, we've got all this proof and stuff, and you, you don't hear anything, nothing happens. So, um, clearly, like, yeah, in, in some ways you'd say, like, oh, it would be nice for there to be a more expedited process of this stuff, but 
you're, you're exactly right. Like, are we really going to lower the bar so much that uh, uh, it, we get really silly in how we try to go after this thing? Max, after a long wait, the Big 12 schedule finally released. There's much fanfare and uh, created a lot of buzz and discussion around what otherwise might just been kind of a, a blip on the radar, quite frankly. Uh, but did you have any, you know, immediate thoughts? You know, Texas is going to Houston or who Oklahoma's playing. What jumped out to you from the Big 12 schedule release? Yeah, I mean, it didn't really seem to, uh, uh, like, evoke a lot of fanfare for the Texas or Oklahoma Twitter account. So, <laughs> I mean, hopefully they'll get the hopefully they'll get the news on that here at some point and put it out uh, to people. Uh, you know, the thing to me, guys, when you're looking at it, because obviously in, in past years, when it's a round robin and you're just kind of flipping the homes and the ways and stuff in the past, like, the schedule release was kind of irrelevant. Like, you could look at the dates and say, oh, this is good or bad or whatever. But everybody had equal schedules. And obviously next year, you know, in, in 23 here, uh, people do not have equal schedules. It was really interesting to see, uh, for me, like the, looking at each each one and the four games they're not playing this season when you when you count all the new opponents in here. And, you know, there's some interesting ones. Like, I, it's just baffling that Oklahoma State is not going to play four of the Texas schools this season. Like, that's just crazy. Same with, I think, OU's only got the one against Texas. Um, you know, I think Cincinnati got a lot of really good breaks in terms of how their schedule goes and not having to play some of the best teams in the Big 12, I don't think Houston got a favorable break, but um, yeah, it's it, it was definitely a lot of fun to look at it. And honestly, guys, like I, I, you know, as of today, we don't really know the state of the divorce of, of Texas, Oklahoma, and the Big 12. But when I was looking at it, it, it did kind of bum me out a little bit just to think, like, okay, we're not getting, mm -hmm. you know, Texas, Oklahoma State, or you know, Oklahoma, Kansas State, or some of these like matchups that have given us like really good games pretty consistently over the last two years, like. We're not, get, not getting it in 23, and, and if we, you know, if they leave in 24, it could be a really long time before those schools are playing non-conference games again. Max, uh, your thoughts about their meeting, the Big 12, ADs, presidents, or whoever else, and your mark, of course, and company, the thought about Gonzaga and adding them perhaps as a way to reach out, and your mark's on record as saying he wants basketball to become kind of international. What are your thoughts about Gonzaga? Is that – is that legitimate? They are obviously talking about it. Yeah, I, it, it's interesting. I think that's where you kind of get into, um, you know, the, the real question mark of, like, what is Brett Yormark's vision for the Big 12 and how do you go um, execute it in the next few years, especially uh, as, like, the Pac-12 situation feels like, you know, it's, it's sort of on hold here while they work through their media rights situation. Um, you know, I think I think his vision for the conference is is certainly yeah bigger than just football and bigger than just the current brand. And so, um, you know, I, I think at the time when this first popped up, um, you know, what we'd heard on like the Gonzaga side was that they would want to go for more than just basketball. Um, and and so, but can they do that in the Pac-12 or the Big 12? Like I'm guessing probably not. You know what I mean? So I think that um, if 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 Mark Few and Gonzaga are willing to go as basketball only. Um, I, I think that's probably an important piece of this. Um, and, and I, yeah, we'd be, be very curious to see if that's a move that, uh, you know, Brett Yormer feels like the conference should make in truly going um, from east to west here as, as a league. Um, and and, if, and, and if, you, if you do that, I guess, what are the other basketball brands you go out and covet then? Max, uh, your column about quarterbacks transferring, you, you know, it's one of those things where you, you kind of think, like, there's a lot of people doing that. But when you put it down – and see the actual numbers of 126 of 168 quarterbacks have transferred like it is it, it kind of staggered me i did like read that sentence about four or five times to really like it is really that much <laughs> well i appreciate you mentioning that yeah I, I did this study three years ago at the end of 2019 just out of curiosity of like it was at signing day and it was just like all right you just signed a quarterback like what are the chances he stays and you know, at the time, the transfer rate on, on quarterbacks for the, the top 50 quarterback recruits for the recruiting classes of 2014 through 2017, the, the transfer rate was 57%. And at the time, I felt like, okay, wow, that's pretty high. I, 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 I'm a little surprised it's like actually a 50-50 like proposition here. And now it's 75%. You know, that's just, that's just what we've got to here in the past few years. And obviously, there's a bunch of rules and things that have changed that kind of contribute to that. But, I mean, you guys have seen it, uh, you know, in, in, in Waco, obviously, where it's like, um, when, whenever you like think you've got a pretty good room and you've got a few options and you've got a future and all that stuff, like, um, you know, enjoy it while you can, because usually if you've got three or four pretty good ones, it's going to be down to one the next year. I mean, guys just, 
um, don't want to wait for their turn to start um, or, or, you know, because of the one-time transfer rule, just believe, like, if you're not getting on the field now in the first two years you're in a program, like, you're probably going to move on. And, uh, you know, we're even seeing guys that, that move on after one year, really. I mean, it's just uh, – it, it's it's a different landscape now. And uh, certainly as you see more and more transfers go win starting jobs at other places, like, it, it just – the, the like part of the, the interest to me was like when you hear the stories of Jane Rashada or Nico, these guys that are getting these big contracts, like not really sure that there's a, a lot of ROI on uh, doing deals for high school quarterbacks at this point. There's a million examples I could use uh, here, but Bryce Petty was born about a decade too early, Max. I mean, him sitting back as long as he did, waiting as long as he did, uh, that would have in this era, you know, by year, the end of year one of waiting. And looking at the depth chart, I mean, he could have had millions thrown at him. I mean, compared to, to how it is now, right? Yeah, how many how many years would Nick Florence be a college starter? If right, moved yeah. On, you know? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, one it, of the names you mentioned, though, though, talking about quarterbacks, Jaden Rashada. He, he made his decision. He's going to go join Kenny Dillingham and uh, Arizona State. Uh, your thoughts on, on the big splash for the Sun Devils? Yeah, uh, not not surprised that that's like the final uh, move for, for Jaden Rashada. Um, his dad uh, went there, and, and there's a lot of a lot of ties there. And Kenny Dillingham uh, recruited Jaden Rashada, not I believe when he was a Florida State man last year at Oregon. So there's a real connection there, and I think a lot of trust on both sides. And I think that's really important after what the the Rashada family went through with Florida. So you know, I think it's overall like actually pretty pretty similar and in some ways pretty good situation for Jaden Rashada where you walk in there where, um, you know, they, they brought in uh, Drew Pine uh, from Notre Dame who has starting experience. Obviously they brought in, in Jacob Conover who's the backup at BYU this last year. Um, you know, seems like a pretty open competition there and a chance for Rashada to uh, develop a little bit and, and, and maybe be a multi-year starter at Arizona State. Or we'll see. We'll see if, if he, this is just a stop for him and, and he's, you know, he'll try and uh, go somewhere else and make more money uh, at a different school next year. I um, I mean, this is such a weird situation at, at Florida. Billy Napier said that, you know, after all of this went down, his first uh, press conference, signing day's press conference, that they looked at 24 other quarterbacks before they settled on Graham Mertz. I mean, I'm, I'm trying not to not Graham Mertz, but we we kind of know what he is after years. I mean, you're, you already said settle on Graham Mertz, so <laughs> yes. you've, already, like, you've yeah. already said that, but keep going. It's, uh, yeah, I'm already down the road. Uh, what would be going on with Billy Napier in year two where there should be some excitement about him where the 24th quarterback they picked or one of those 24 was Graham Mertz and not somebody maybe, maybe better? Like, you know, why are they not in it for Devin Leary or, or somebody like that? Yeah, I, you know, I think Florida was one of those, like, it was very obvious they were in the market for a transfer, and, and they were a school that was linked to, um, you know, a guy like, like Grayson McCall, who had some great issues and had to go back to Coastal Carolina. You know, they were certainly, like, interested in some of these guys, but, like, if they went in the portal, like a Sam Hartman um, or Michael Pratt from Tulane, and, and I think that ultimately it's, like, in, in the musical chairs game, like, you know, the, the, the better guys went other places. You know, Devin Leary goes to Kentucky, and um, you know, like the more coveted players kind of chose other spots. And so, yeah, they, they took Graham Mertz and, and that's kind of how it goes. Like if you're really, you know, obviously Anthony Richardson going as a redshirt sophomore is like one of the things you probably don't totally predict going into 22, but um, you know, then, then you have a need and um, it's going to be an interesting competition where Graham Mertz is just a guy that um, just really did not get much better over the course of his time at Wisconsin. And I think a fresh start is probably good for him. Um, but you really wonder, like, um, is, is he the guy, is Jack Miller the guy, like, can Florida go find somebody that can really get it done? Because, um, you know, Anthony Richardson leaves pretty early in his career. I think he, he, he really could have taken a jump in 23, but instead of going pro and shoot, probably may end up being a first rounder just based off his tools. And so, yeah, it, it, Florida's in an interesting spot here where you don't really feel like they're loading up for a big run necessarily in year two. Max, thank you. As always, glad you got a chance to kind of just – Take a deep breath. We all need it. Fix we, things around yeah. the house. Well, yeah. we all need it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You couple For sure. of, Thanks, guys. Thank you. That's Max Olson, the athletic.com with us and right in the middle of all that transfer portal. We I, I was gonna ask him this, we could do this again, but the combination of what you signed or who you signed out of high school, and then also who you are before and after incoming and outgoing in the transfer portal to me would be the most important top whatever that that should be like the the june 1st 
ra- rankings. Yeah, because, because you've May got 1st that other, is another transfer. Yeah, you've got yeah. that other transfer window. So I say June 1st, but whatever that time is where you expect to kind of have your roster set of the guys who leave in spring, uh, then evaluate what your whole transfer class is, what your whole recruiting class is, and then, and then come up with some sort of composite number there. It would be interesting to see. Uh, and, again, that changes, you know, that ever flowing because, you know, you can, you know, you can whiff on everybody or you can hit on everybody or it's some combination between. I do think what um, is is interesting to me about the transfer portal is it's so low risk, really. I mean, because it is free agency and coaches call it that. But the thing about free agency in sports is, look, in, in professional sports, if I go and sign a guy to a five, seven, eight year deal and he's not good for two years and then I – kick him down the road, um, then I'm on the hook for six years or in Major League Baseball or whatever the salary cap implications are in the other sports. Um, the NFL, you, you've got a dead money and all that. In college sports, shoot, guy transfers, doesn't work out, gets hurt, whatever. I mean, it's only a year bust, really, because you can move him on down the road and um, and then replace him with someone else. Yeah, that's what I don't like about it. Yeah. Um, I mean – here, here's what I, I guess I don't like about it is uh, I love that your team cannot be that good and can in five months suddenly have a completely new team and be revamped. I mean, that's fun. You don't have like the full reconstruction project necessarily as often as you might. Um, but there's there's no repercussions for not doing your job well. I mean, you have to really just not do your job well and lose a lot to lose your job. I mean, because – if you aren't that great of a recruiter, that can be covered up now to a certain degree. If you whiffed on all these guys, NIL money-wise or whatever, half of them are gone, Jimbo. You know, like, they're gone. How do you replace it? Go to the transfer portal. Go get everybody else's cast-offs or not even cast-offs, but guys that, you know, maybe somebody that you kind of know but aren't attached to it officially sent that person a DM. Hey, you'd be interested in coming to college. You know, like, if you but aren't we your... seeing more coaching changes as much now as ever before? Or, or you think that's about to kick in and be less? Uh, I don't really have – haven't sat down and really thought about it all that much. I'm just saying that if you were a good recruiter, that was an advantage that you had, like being an identifier of talent, knowing at the high school level or at the JUCO level or whatever, like I see that diamond in the rough, we're going to create him from you know clay and mold him into this guy. Now you might find that guy – but now the big school comes in after a year once you've developed him and, and brought him up, and now they come swooping and they grab him from you. Like that development piece of you landed this guy who is a project, but you built him up into this great NFL story after three or four years. I just don't think that those types of stories are going to be nearly as as um, as often as, as maybe they were before. Not that that was like a, an occurrence like us all the time or anything, but you, you went to a program – you sat there and you developed for better or, or for worse sometimes. And so that's what's great as, as far as having this exit for the, the athlete goes. But for the coaches who recruit really well and find and identify those guys, you have no guarantee they're on your campus after a year. And I just think that kind of sucks. So if you are somebody who is not a great recruiter or maybe a not great identifier of talent, well, that's okay. You whiffed on this half this class. You can just go to the transfer portal and go grab a bunch of guys that now you know more about. And I just think that that, that element of – what separates the different parts of being a great coach are just eliminated in so many ways. And, and so that's where I, I don't like it as much because it, it doesn't give us the, the full picture like maybe we once had. Garrett, let me know when you have this. Um, Chris Vanini just put this up on Twitter, and Garrett's kind of trying to get it ready for us. What you were absolutely what you just said. So the NCAA removed the signing limit cap this year. And next year, leading to look at these classes on how many incoming players, both signing for out of high school and transfer portal. Arizona State, Dillingham, new coach. Dion at Colorado. Matt Rule at Nebraska. Oregon, second year with Dan Lanning. Oklahoma, second year with Venables. Mississippi State, unfortunately, because of the tragic death of Mike Leach, a, a, a new coach. Memphis, Georgia Southern. Look at how many incoming players on what are 85 scholarship limit rosters. Half or almost half, in some cases more, of the roster has been changed. Yeah, that's uh, 
That's, you know, that's what the, in the NFL, that's kind of what the Texans did a couple years ago when they knew that they were like, they're going to, they're in kind of salary cap jail. They're, you know, Deshaun Watson's not going to play for them anymore. They have to just kind of clear out everything. They sent a bunch of players to one or two year deals. And that's what they've been kind of rolling through uh, the last couple of years. Uh, that is now the, the college football equivalent of it. And you've got a new coach. You're going to clear out players. Some of the players you don't even have to clear out. They'll leave before you even really get there. As soon as, as soon as Scott Frost got fired, there are probably ten guys that were like, "Look, I don't care who no. comes in here. Yeah. If it's if if it's the reanimated corpse of Bill Walsh, I'm not going to stay here." And if, Nebraska yeah, lost a, exactly. They lost so a they're chunk. just going to yeah. leave. So then that's a chunk, maybe ten to more more that just decided, "I don't care who it is, they're gone." And then on and on and on down the line that you're going to lose. And well, when we were with uh, Coach Rule a couple weeks ago, uh, and he was down here, Phil Snow asked him about what was the number in the class. He's like, "I don't even know what it's going to be yeah. because there's no limit." because of the new rules. Part of this uh, Vanini added was needed because schools are losing so many transfers. They couldn't get even back up to 85. It's obvious you have schools nudging more kids into the portal to open up spots. Now the NCAA said it would monitor the numbers for the next couple of years and go from there. And that's what I mean too. Like, I mean, you know, if you screwed up on your recruiting class, you screwed up and that's going to have ramifications. Yep. Your decisions and your planning was off and you will pay for that. But now there's no repercussion. Now you're just like, nudge him into the portal, go grab the next guy, and hope that guy sticks. And that's great as fans. It's great as media. It gives us tons to talk about. I love it for the players. It's freedom of movement, and they are do that. Long overdue that based on the way the old structure was set up where they had basically zero. I mean, the players deserved and still deserve even more freedom. But, I mean, this is where I'm talking about with, like, the, the parameters of just the constant moving around. It, it's great for the teams and all that, but that was part of the deal, man. That's how you could separate this coach from that coach was this guy could stay in there and develop and identify and all that. And now you have guys signing number one recruiting classes, and half the, the class is gone in less than a year. Yeah. And it's like – what? Yeah, there are no consequences. Well, uh, I, eventually, you better start but, signing some pretty good because you could, you, again, the, the transfer portal is a crap. But shoot. this cycle, I mean, some of these things are a bit of a winding road. For example, sure. um, used to if you were a first year coach and the team had been bad for a long time, for example, Deion Sanders or Matt Rule, let's take out their star power in it. Like right. just that they're the, the coach. And they've had this situation where both of their schools have been behind the eight ball for, for a decade or more. So you would have normally had to, you know, you can tell the fans and the alumni and everything else, like, look, you guys know how bad this was. I need three or four years to, like, get my players in here and cycle through some of this stuff. Well, now because of the transfer portal, you don't need three or four years anymore. So people will start realizing, like, hold on a minute. Like, you know, it's not about getting – you know, players are going to help you win a national championship necessarily, but players that can w help you build a roster to win seven or eight games, you can do that a lot faster right now to where you can start building towards that. So once fans start picking up on who's good or not at that transfer portal part of it, then I do think that maybe that, that shifts back away and there are consequences for it because if you can't so, navigate either one. So in the end, over the next, let's say, five years, will what we now see or what we see now, will this allow coaches – to not be uh, – that the carousel won't be as rampant as we maybe have seen the last couple of oh, years. No, or is it always going to still be the I same? I think it's going to be that okay. way. Yeah, All I think right. so. I mean, there's 100-something schools. Yeah. So it's not like there's yeah. not going to be 10 openings every year. That's going to be automatic. And at some point, like, something's going to have to give too – I mean, you can pile up all these great schools in one conference all you want, but somebody's got to be the best of that, right? Somebody's got to lose. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, the odds of all, the, you know, USC, UCLA, and I, and UCLA I don't put in that same category with Oklahoma and Texas and USC as far as football goes. But, you know, there are going to be expectations. And, yeah, somebody's going to have to be at the bottom of the standings. And, and maybe not those new schools, but someone else will suffer as a result of their, their entries. But, yeah, I mean, and I, I just think it's, it's so – wide ranging like all of the changes that it makes because on the one hand you could say that coaches have even less time now because now you don't have the excuse of having to build a roster okay like hey i need three years matt rule to build up the the roster in lincoln and get our 85 scholarships back right well now you can go get 40 freaking players in one off season so how long does it really take you to build up this 85 man roster it should take you probably half the time that it used to right 
so especially if you're at a big school with NIL. Um, it, it, you know, in a year's time, you could flip your entire roster. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just don't like it because it, it, it takes – I mean, I say I don't like it. I, I think it's all very interesting, but there's, like, different parts to it. It's not just, yes, I like it, no, I like it. The, one of the parts that I don't like is there's not any repercussions if you are not a great recruiter and not a great identifier of talent because I feel like that's one of those advantages that separates guys, and I think that's going to be uh, less of an advantage or less obvious now, but it will be super beneficial to the folks on the other side. So it, it, it well, well, you know gives and takes. Who, who won this year, and this is only really year one and a half or so of the NIL, right? Year two? Who We're won? Year three, I think, at this point. Is it three? Okay. Who won this year that is not normally a part of the party? Um, How many teams? Let's say among the top ten. TCU is obviously one of them. They benefited from the portal. Tulane is one of those right outside the cusp, and they probably had some coming and going too. So – Will it change who is the upper echelon? I, no. no. I or mean, will it just be an, a, a, a one-off? I think but I think it'll make – it gives teams options to get better faster. Look, I'll give – the coach, uh, Craig, I think that you uh, are inadvertently talking about, about how we don't know how good the recruiter is right now, uh, Mike Norvell. Because, look, he's only been at Florida State a short time. So, really – uh, don't really know how good of a high school recruiter he is. What we do know about him is he is a wizard in the portal. Like, you know, if you look at the, the biggest playmakers they had this year, uh, Trey Benson, portal. Now, uh, Jordan Travis was from the portal. He was before that, but still, portal. Um, Johnny Wilson, their big-time wide receiver, portal. All their other wide receivers, Micah Pittman, portal. A uh, bunch of – Jared, their best defensive player, portal. So – He's really good at that. We'll see how good he is at high school recruiting, but he's been able to, you know, accelerate the process there without having to, you know, do it with 25 high school recruits a year. He can, he can mix and match a lot, a lot better. Well, here's right. the deal. He might not ever have to. Yeah. Uh, what do I'm we? Sorry. I'm sorry. We got to get to Mickey. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, he might not ever have to because it's the new era of college football, so he can just portal it every year. That's true. I mean, true. and so, like, I, I'm just saying that it sucks for the guys who are great identifiers of talent, and they, they got advantages not because of NIL or because of the, be, they had the big brand attached to them, but they were just good. Like, I'm thinking of, like, the, the Matt Rule staff that was here in Waco and how they went and found some diamonds in the rough. That's kind of what they're trying to do in Lubbock now uh, to, to the same degree, and – there will be rewards for that, but there, there's also that downside that, yeah, you might find that guy, but then the big school just comes calling, and I know that's where culture comes into play. So it's, it's obviously it's, it's way more complicated than just a yes or no, this is good or this is bad. But, um, yeah, it's, it's all very interesting. That's, that's what we do know. Satterfield, who's the offensive coordinator at Nebraska, was driving through Colorado to go see a player, was driving through, I think, the Denver area and decided to go look at a high school that he just happened to see off on the side of the road ended up signing a player who's like Kalen Barnes, that type. I mean, with that kind of high-class speed that was getting no offers because the coach said, hey, thanks for coming. Nobody ever comes by here. Those, are the, you, you, those stories are great, but, yeah, you wonder how many more of those. But, yeah, uh, it, it's awesome, the, 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 the give and take, and eventually we'll see how this affects whoever can jump up like TCU did this year. When we come back, Mickey Spagnola, DallasCowboys.com. Stonewood Dental in Robinson, Texas, Dr. Steve Childress has allowed and helped me have so much more confidence in my smile and also in my dental work because for the longest of time, I did not pay enough attention to it. And when things started to go bad, I waited too long to tell somebody. And then I met Dr. Steve Childress, who had been talking to me for a couple of years. And now when something feels wrong, something kind of stings or there's any kind of, whoa, what was that? I call them, and I go by there, and we figure it out. And he, of course, is amazing at what he does, along with his staff of dentists, hygienists, and many more. Stonewood Dental also, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful building inside. When you walk in that door, you will be amazed by the energy, by how everyone is making sure you're okay. And, yes, sometimes when you go to a dentist, you're worried about what the answers or the evidence might be. You will feel comfortable from start to finish. Believe me, I know. Stonewood Dental, Dr. Steve Childress in Robinson, Texas.
Pizza, burgers, and Bears football. There's no place around Waco that serves them all other than Bubba's 33. Come show your green and gold and enjoy some of Waco's best food and beverages while watching your favorite team, the Bears. When real Bears fans get hungry, Bubba's 33 is the number one spot for ice-cold drinks, hand-stretched, stone-baked pizzas, and bacon-infused burgers. Join us for indoor or patio dining. Bubba's 33, Waco's restaurant and proud supporter of Baylor Bears football. Sick'em, Bears. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics. The team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike, whether it's knee or shoulder pain, hand or wrist injuries, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trust. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics. Wants to get you back in the game. In the market for a quality metal building? Since 1943, Pioneer Steel and Pipe has helped Central Texas residential and commercial customers with metal building design, panel options, building components, and trim options. Pioneer Steel and Pipe's residential line is energy efficient, offers low maintenance, reduces insurance payments, is impact resistant, and carries up to a 45-year limited warranty. In addition, they can also help you find a metal building contractor for your project. Pioneer Steel and Pipe with locations in Waco and Bryan and at pioneersboys.com. What are you waiting for? Next year's New Year's resolution to lose weight, get fit, start working out? 3, 2, 1, go to Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness. If you really want to get in shape, get rid of weight or inches, you have to make a commitment to work out in the excuses of not enough time, you're too tired or too busy. There's a special place that will change your life at Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness on Lakeshore Drive in Waco. And they have a commitment to you too. With personal trainers Christy London, Randall Corley, and Alex Bosch, State-of-the-art Cybex equipment, new weights and spin bikes, clean and spacious locker rooms, each with a whirlpool and sauna, and a staff that will know your name when you walk through the front door. Elite tennis facilities and a great tennis pro in Britt Coleman. Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness is a place you can call home, a place you can work out on your own or with 40-plus group exercise classes. It's time for you to get in shape, lose inches, get fit at Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness on Lake Shore Drive in Waco. Hi, this is Paul Catalina. I recently got engaged to the love of my life, but the most important thing that I had to do before I popped the question was get that perfect ring. And I know nothing about rings. So I went to the wedding ring store, Boozer's Jewelers on Valley Mills Drive. I knew I needed a custom design, and that's exactly what they do. Nine out of 10 of their engagement rings are designed in-house. The entire process took less than a month, and they were great every step of the way. Great options on financing, excellent selection, and talented designers. My fiance, and I get nonstop compliments on the ring. I only deserve credit for doing the smartest thing I could, walking into boozers and letting them work their magic. Your one-of-a-kind fiance deserves a one-of-a-kind ring, and that's what you get at Boozers. Boozers Jewelers, the wedding ring store on Valley Mills Drive. This is 365 Sports. It's time for our weekly segment with Mickey Spagnola of DallasCowboys.com. Prescott, fire, Touchdown! Brought to you by the First National Bank of Central Texas with five locations to serve you. Mickey Spagnola, DallasCowboys.com with us on 365 Sports. Mickey, great to have you. We appreciate it. Okay, the season's over, but with the Cowboys, it is never for somebody who covers them, a columnist, a beat writer. You've been all of that and above. Uh, and it's already been kind of a busy week. McCarthy, the play calling. Solari, the <laughs> offensive line coach. Kellen Moore out. He's in he's in L.A. Uh, just business as normal? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I call it the non-game season, not the off season, because the NFL <clears throat> is never off. You know, all the things you just said, along with the senior bowl going on and everybody trying to fill up their uh, coaching staff. Uh, yeah. It's business as usual, uh, as you just pointed out. Mickey, what is the best way to describe what happened with Kellen Moore in that the offense was good? Uh, clearly, they had some deficiencies and things that were going well. Was it just the need for new voices in the room? I think that's sometimes one of the things, and not just with him, but maybe with some of the other 
uh, assistant coaches, they decided not to uh, re-sign. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I always remember uh, back to 1997 uh, when the Cowboys uh, ended up losing, what, the last five games of the year. They finished 6-10. and 10, And I remember running into Ernie Zampezi in the hallway kind of the couple days after that final loss. And Barry Switzer, they hadn't parted ways with him yet. And uh, Ernie looked at me and he goes, well, we're all out of here. And I go, what do you mean? You do a good job. And he goes, sometimes you need a different voice in the, in the room. And, you know, he had done a heck of a job as an offensive coordinator. He didn't get, you know, stupid in one year, but uh, that was his point. Uh, I think the other thing um, that, that just maybe, you know, the, it, it's a new voice, maybe, you know, part of, part of me thinks that, you remember, Kellen Moore, um, maybe he wanted to get out from underneath uh, a head coach who had been an offensive coordinator. Because if you think about it, he worked for Jason Garrett. He worked for Mike McCarthy. And I don't know if any of that had to play into the interviews uh, that he had as a head coach. Uh, but sometimes when, when you get interviewed like that, they're thinking, okay, but was this guy really doing everything? Now, he was about doing everything uh, here, and he didn't get a head coaching job. So maybe he thought also – that, you know, uh, if I go somewhere else and be an offensive coordinator for a defensive-minded head coach, maybe that improves my uh, opportunities to get a head coaching job. Because remember, you know, he could interview for a head coaching job as the Cowboys' offensive coordinator, but you can't interview for a lateral move. So part of me thinks, well, maybe when they said this was mutual – this was mutual since he might have known that the charge, and obviously because it happened the next day, right, that the Chargers were interested in him in being the offensive coordinator. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think one thing that has happened uh, with all these moves the Cowboys are trying to make is that last game against San Francisco has kind of clouded everything they did during the regular season and the first round of the playoffs, because they were pretty good offensively, right? Take away Dak's interceptions that weren't all his, by the way. Uh, th they were pretty powerful on offense. If you think about those nine games when they averaged 36 points a game in nine games in a row. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know that everybody's, you know, everybody's trying to place blame for San Francisco uh, and maybe just San Francisco was a better matchup for the Cowboys uh, short of the quarterback matchup. Mickey Solari was with Landry as an yes. offensive line coach. I, I saw, I don't know who it was, uh, that put out the note that he was going to be uh, the next offensive line coach, and then I saw somebody go youth movement, and then I'm like, okay, wait a minute, that must be a, like a son because I, <laughs> I do remember, and if you and I, we covered those Landry years, uh, this guy's got a lot of a lot of rings around the tree, but he has been a lot of places. Uh, how well respected has he been in the business? Yeah, I think he's been really uh, well respected. And when he was with the Cowboys, it was eighty seven, eighty eight, and he was the special teams coach and the assistant offensive line coach, not the offensive line coach as an assistant. So he was the assistant. I think it was to Erkenbeck, if I remember correctly. Uh, so yeah, he's, he's been around, he's 60 some years old. He'd been in the league, uh, you know, I want to say 20, 30, 20 some years. Uh, so yeah, he's, uh, he's been around and he, he was available. He wasn't with anybody this past year, but in 2015, he was Mike McCarthy's offensive line coach in green Bay. So they did have somewhat of a connection. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see, you know, w what the connection was there to say, okay, let's move on from here uh, and, and, and try to, you know, maybe get another voice in that uh, uh, offensive room. 
Since according to Jerry Jones, that Mike McCarthy is going to call the plays, what kind of offensive coordinator do you think the Cowboys will hire? Because a lot of guys in the league now, like you just mentioned about Kellen Moore, wanted to go someplace where they can prove that they're doing everything. But if you know that you're already not going to call the plays, it's obviously going to change your, your maybe career path or goals towards the Cowboys. What do you think we can expect from that? Yeah, I think it'll be a – a coach that has probably not been an offensive coordinator before that is trying to be upwardly mobile. Uh, and I think he would be a guy <clears throat> that take, would take care of the day-to-day chores during the week of, you know, mapping out the, the practice schedule, uh, helping uh, with uh, the scouting of the next opponent and figuring out uh, what sort of game plan uh, you know, it, it'll be a collaborative, uh, I think, uh, deal. Uh, but just think of the Kansas City Chiefs, right? I mean, Andy Reid's the offensive play caller, right? He, he's calling the plays. Uh, but, you know, they, ha- they have, um, I'm going to forget his name. The enemy. The enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and check out with the enemy. No one's hiring him as a head coach, right? Because I think they feel like, well, he, is he really the offensive coordinator? Uh, and is he really calling the plays or is Andy Reid doing it? So I think it would be somebody trying to take that next step. And I'm not saying a young guy that's not doing it. It could be, uh, you know, an assistant coach that's been around but never has had the opportunity to really be the offensive coordinator. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, that's kind of what they're probably looking for. Uh, you know, they've, they've, um, they've interviewed, uh, a couple guys. It was John Nixon was one of them. Jeff Nixon. Uh, I'm sorry. Jeff Nixon. He was here at Baylor. Yeah. Jeff Nixon. Yeah. Yeah. The guy from Baylor. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and an, another guy that, um, had been with the Rams, uh, and, and they were kind of position coaches, but they never were the coordinator. And maybe they're looking for somebody that's a coordinator that can, uh, you know, have the title uh, and then kind of, you know, maybe they that kind of is a stepping stone to getting uh, a head coach uh, interview opportunity. Mickey Spagnola, DallasCowboys.com with us on 364, 365 Sports on Thursdays. So, Mickey, the, uh, the Super Bowl, Philadelphia, Kansas City, these two teams have pretty much led from start to finish. The Bills obviously had their run. The Bengals had their run. And there were others in San Francisco. Dallas was kind of hanging around. Are, are these the two best teams in the NFL? I think they've played the best, absolutely, uh, and uh, over a, a, the long haul. Uh, and and I, I think that, you know, it, it, it would have been interesting if the Cowboys could have played Philadelphia one more time, right? They split, and each team won when the other team didn't have the starting quarterback there. But all I know is in that second meeting when the Cowboys beat them 40-34, I believe it was, um, they scored 40 points on that defense. So something the Cowboys were doing offensively was working, right? Uh, But they didn't get that opportunity. Uh, They didn't earn the right. Uh, So, yeah, uh, you know, I I think, though, when, when you look at it from a record standpoint and the amount of games those teams won, you know, th- these, were, these were the two teams that, you know, should have met uh, in, in the final. Mickey, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And uh, the Senior Bowl's going on, right? Is that, you used to go to that, did you not? Did you used yeah, to go? Yeah, I did. Uh, I think they thought they had younger guys that were better scouts. Oh, my Lord. Know? Yeah. I- <laughs> Well, I, I know that you've been pretty much to every event. Thanks for your time. We appreciate you. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Yeah, absolutely. Good to be with you, you guys. You too. It's Mickey Spagnola, the senior uh, writer for the Dallas Cowboys, for DallasCowboys.com with us. And uh, many things with the offensive line coaching change, who's going to be the offensive coordinator, the Mike McCarthy calling plays, and even some other roster notes too when we come back. Craig Smoke, off the radar, and this is 365 Sports. Richard Carr, Buick GMC Cadillac, they are the people that you can count on, not only for great customer service, but also for 
uh, great deals, uh, whether they be new or pre-owned vehicles or whether you're just going to Richard Carr to get, you know, door jam fixed or get your tires fixed. Uh, they can take care of all of that as, again, they are the people that you can count on, and uh, they have been for over two decades here in Central Texas. And as a matter of fact, with Richard Carr, I had a couple of incidents uh, really over the last couple of years that gave me some issues. And when I needed some help, I turned to them, and they were able to patch things up quite nicely and make everything as great customer service-wise as possible for me. So right now, take advantage of uh, some great deals that are on the lot over at Richard Carr, uh, and that includes uh, dozens of Sierra trucks. Uh, qualified buyers get special financing on the 2023 GMC Sierra. Qualified buyers get special financing on GMC Terrain SUVs uh, or the entire lineup of Buick SUVs in stock. They've got a Texas size selection, most inventory they've had in a couple of years, over 150 vehicles currently on the lot and ready to drive home today. And if you're not interested, perhaps in the, the 2023 Sierras, it's pretty good vehicle. You might want to check it out if you are in the market to buy new. It's got uh, best in class towing, unsurpassed strength and premium comfort. But if that's not up your alley and you're looking to buy more pre-owned, well, they've got 80 quality pre-owned cars and trucks in stock, many of them under $20,000. They're affordable, they're thoroughly inspected, and they are ready to finance for almost any credit rating. And maybe you're not buying new. Maybe you're also not looking to buy a pre-owned. Maybe you're not looking to buy at all. Well, that's where you take advantage of Richard Carr's terrific customer service. You're just wanting to drive your car or truck a little while longer. Uh, their award-winning service department is standing by to keep you on the road. Go to the website. You can see their service specials. You can also set appointments for quick and reliable service or repair. So whatever it is you're looking for, new, pre-owned, or just simply getting some work done, check out the dealership that's been in business for 23 years in Central Texas, run by proud Central Texans. Log on to richardcar.com today. Call now or go see them now. Off Highway 6 at the Imperial Exit. This is 365 Sports. The 4 o'clock hour is sponsored by Boozer's Jewelers, the wedding ring store, specializing in custom jewelry and repair. All in-house. Y'all listen up. Let me tell you something about group meals from Rudy's Barbecue. It's got all you need for all the folks you gotta feed, smoke, meat, sides, and more. There's everything down to the tablecloth, just like the one that you see at the store. At a bridal shower, it's better than flowers. And a long business meeting, it'll pass the hours. It'll feed all the cousins at a family function. It's better than potluck at a church luncheon. Next time you need to feed 10 or more, call and order a Rudy's group meal. Next in line. Stepping into a new pair of boots is great, but stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can also add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. There are more than 150 occupational specialties to help them find the best fit for their future. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lake Shore Drive and North 19th Street, right behind the bank, is a hidden gem in Waco. If you're a fan of bourbon, especially local Texas bourbons, that's where you gotta go. Balcones, TX, Devil's River, whatever it is, they've got it. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, plus the best selection of craft beers in Waco, seasonally churned out throughout the year. Whether it's spring, summer, fall, or winter, Riverbend Liquor and Wine, best selection of craft beers, a speedy drive through window, an excellent and customer service. Find out more on Instagram or just go by and see them. Lakeshore Drive at North 19th Street behind the bank. There are 26 letters in the alphabet, over 600,000 words in the dictionary, and just three of them said together can change everything. Let's order pizza. Those three words lead to dough made from scratch and three fresh signature cheeses that blanket golden crust in a heavenly melt on Marco's Pizza that'll blow your mind. So visit Marco's.com to order and stop by Marco's Pizza in Bellmead, China Spring, Woodway, and in Robinson. Marco's. Pizza lovers get it. 
John's Humidor, your home with a 48-foot walk-in humidor with the elite cigar brands from around the world, including the number one cigar of the year, Aging Room, Quattro Nicaragua. Plus, they have the great brands like Macanudo and Artur Fuente, Rocky Patel, Aston, and so much more. CBD, great for sore muscles, aches and pains, sleep, Vita Dreams and anxiety, mild depression, general health and wellness. Their staff, very knowledgeable on the subject. If anyone is curious about CBD, ask Carolyn Ashley, Don Schumanor in the Townwood Shopping Center off Valley Mills in Waco. With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Niche Group Insurance Agency. With the Niche Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Niche Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts at the Niche Group at 1-800-258-8302. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. It's time for Craig Smokes Off the Radar. Brought to you by Pickup Outfitters. Since 1997, we've been outfitting trucks, SUVs, and vans at 220 Lake Air Drive or createacommotion.com. Welcome back into 365 Sports. Time for a little Off the Radar. It's just segment taking a look at some headlines that uh, we might not normally get to or or talk much about and you know this is a, a time of year where this segment can get a little thin because a lot of the headlines are college football related well we've already talked about most of that sometimes I'll still inject some of that but uh, for the most part I think we've we've covered most of that ground so just a kind of a couple things that are that are going on today um, and that includes the NFL starting quarterback carousel or just quarterback carousel uh, in general. Uh, Jimmy G, at one point in time, a pretty hot name. At one point in time, if you go way back, he was the heir apparent to Tom Brady. He's going to be the next in the the dynasty of the Patriots and and all that jazz. And and obviously that went a different direction. And then he's going to be the guy in San Francisco. And he's going to, you know, and that's now gone a different direction as well. And he's not even the, the second guy in San Francisco. He's not even going to be in San Francisco for very much longer. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo, Kyle Shanahan said uh, on Wednesday that he does not see a scenario where they are going to have Brock Purdy, Trey Lance, and Jimmy Garoppolo on the uh, San Francisco 49ers roster in 2023, uh, or really any scenario where Garoppolo is on the roster in in 2023. It's going to be the Purdy and Lance show. Uh, Last year, they tried to get rid of Jimmy G, but he was uh, under contract. Uh, There's not as much of that have to worry about now this time around, and so Jimmy G, where does he go from here? This could lead to a lot of different. This could lead to a lot of different, uh, you know, rumors and, and whatnot about where he could potentially go. But um, where do you see him possibly landing? Uh, I I think that it's now that the Tom Brady domino has fallen. There's been so much stuff that that's open. I mean, I could see him in Tampa because their situation is Kyle Trask and I think Blaine Gabbert uh, there. Um, I could see him in Las Vegas because Josh McDaniels was part of the Patriots and knows Jimmy G. Uh, I could see him. I could see him in Carolina with Frank Reich. Those are the three that maybe jump out to me the most. Washington is stuck with Wentz. I don't know if they're stuck but with they, him. But they 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 have they have Howell. And they're not going to make that move because they, if next time they make a move for a quarterback, it needs to be somebody they get lucky in the draft who's elite. And, and they're just going to keep drafting in the top 15 for a long time. Miami has Tua, the Jets. I mean, does Washington yeah. also have Heineke? Like, yeah, they have Heineke. Yeah, no, I, yeah, no, I, no, I, I they'd have to him. make a couple moves. Uh, Although, What about the Jets? The Jets, um, I don't know about the Jets. The Jets, I mean, they've got Zach Wilson. I mean, would he That's yeah. would he do would he go to that? Time. Yeah. The other thing about, I mean, I guess that they're I mean, they're gonna let Jimmy G go, but they're gonna have to probably make another move at quarterback, at least for a veteran. Um, because Trey Lance it will be fine for the offseason program. Brock Purdy won't. Brock Purdy won't be there because he's got that elbow injury yep. that if it's worst case scenario, he's gonna have to have Tommy John, which means he's probably out for next year as well. well so will Brady's domino effect 
or will it be Rodgers that may affect where Garoppolo goes? Well, let me get to that eventually right. um, because Shanahan also talked about not only basically just ruling out like, yeah, Jimmy G is not going to be here. Uh, they're going to move forward with Purdy and Lance, but – uh, Purdy does have to get healthy first, uh, torn ulnar collateral ligament in his right elbow. He had further imaging, according to ESPN, done on Tuesday, and no decision has yet been made on whether he will go reconstruction, which is Tommy John, as you mentioned, or repair, which is an internal brace procedure. Uh, John Lynch, also speaking to the media, was uh, indicating that they will probably go the internal brace procedure, which would be the repair route and that would be a good thing because that would mean a shorter recovery time and he could actually be back on the field by around the start of training camp in late July or early August so that looks to be the way that it's leaning right now and they are taking that as a positive bit of news but there hasn't been a final decision uh, made so um, yeah if he goes that uh, the surgical repair route with the internal brace uh, could begin rehab as soon as three months after the procedure and get full clearance at the six-month mark, which Shanahan said was was great news to hear. But as far as Rodgers goes, uh, he is playing in a uh, pro-am. I think it's the Pebble Beach pro-am going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was going up to uh, tee off on one of the, the holes there. And uh, I guess the announcer, I guess they had like a live mic, and I don't know exactly who the announcer was, but he, uh, as Aaron Rodgers sitting there, teeing up he's like hey you got any news you want to break with us like you want to you want to say anything and all Aaron Rodgers says I'm not going to San Francisco so that's what he said he said I'm not going to San Francisco dude can hold a grudge now. <laughs> yeah he, that's all he said and he just like got back to teeing up his ball and, and then and made his shot but uh yeah that is that is one route that you can rule out you know yeah. you can say a lot about him but he actually if you really he can be just what seemed like a, always miserable but he's not he, he's weird, but he also has a hell of a sense of humor. He, yeah, and he's candid. I, I I do I appreciate a lot of things about Aaron Rodgers. or some things that you know I wonder about, but I do appreciate a lot of things about him. Um, and I, I can see how he could probably, if you work with him, be a lot. But there's a lot of guys who really love him. Uh, in fact, Devonte Adams. Somebody tweeted out um, what neighborhood is. Aaron Relic, like a Raiders fan, like tweeted at Devonte Adams, like, "What neighborhood is Aaron Rodgers gonna gonna live in?" And Devonte responded, "Mine." Yeah. And so everybody's taking that to mean that like they've talked and Aaron's told them yep. this. I think Devonte Adams is just having, I mean, just having fun with the guy. Sure. And probably, well, look, if Derek Carr, who is his best friend from college, is gonna leave, and he knows that. You know, the next thing I would want if I was Devonte Adams is the guy that made is me the famous. Guy, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I'm going to say that whether it's going to happen or not, and if it happens, that means that the Raiders are going to have to come up with sixty million dollars in cap room, or what do they have to do to get them from the Packers or work that all out? So yeah, um, and, and a far more serious story. This is weird because I remember seeing this guy's name, and I'm sorry for West Virginia fans out there, but uh, because you're you're related to this in some way, but. Eagles offensive lineman Josh Sills. Did you guys see this story? Mm -hmm. Indicted by uh, county court grand jury on one count of rape, one count of kidnapping, which are both first-degree felonies. That was uh, released by the Ohio Attorney General, uh, their website, uh, Ohio Attorney General's website. Uh, this is from an incident uh, in which he engaged in, quote, sexual activity that was not consensual, held a victim against her will back in December of 20. 19 uh the crime was reported back then and then there was a an investigation um or the, the, the crime was immediately reported uh the sheriff's office conducted a detailed investigation it was presented to the grand jury and is being prosecuted by the special prosecution section of the attorney general's office blah 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 anyways a summons has been issued uh, and he will have to appear in court on February 16th. As a result, he's been placed on the commissioner's exempt list, according to the NFL, and cannot participate in anything, uh, practice, game, travel, what have you, uh, with the Eagles, as uh, he will be under their personal conduct policy review. And the Eagles just said, hey, we've we've looked at it, and, and uh, you know, there's not much that they can, can really do about it. ESPN had a, a whole write-up on the police report, uh, and what happened uh, back in early December of 2019 um, had uh, incident uh, the or spoke about the incident, um, you know, that uh, 
that took place in, in detail. Uh, but he's originally from Ohio, an undrafted free agent signing this past April, but he was at West Virginia, and he yep. was there for – four seasons and then eventually transferred to Oklahoma State. And I remember when he went to Oklahoma State, I was like, oh, that's a big, you know, a big get. Just name-wise, it, it rang with me. But, yeah, uh, so apparently when he went to Oklahoma State, that this was, I guess, a behind the scenes, you know, there was work being done. But, yeah, uh, everybody's gearing up to go to the Super Bowl. He will be not. Instead, he might be going to jail here pretty soon, which if the allegations are true, obviously would, would be the more deserved route. But just, uh, yeah, kind of an, an out-of-nowhere story there and – uh, just a real shame, and and hope the you know the victim is uh, is doing okay. But yeah. it's now, how awful. many years ago was that? Three, three, three years or four ago? years yeah. ago. Yeah. 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 So the wheel, the wheels of justice turn very very slow, um, mm-hmm. and the legal system does not work very fast. So um, hope justice does get served in this case uh, for sure. But yeah, yeah what a, what a really strange out of nowhere story. Um, the week before the Super Bowl. Yeah, and it's just, you know, like especially when you're moving around and stuff, too, you wonder, like, how stuff can get lost, mm. you know, and you don't really realize, like, something happened back here. He just moved over here, though, real quick, and you're not you're completely unaware of, you know, what he's maybe running from or, or what have you. But, yeah, I mean, he's facing some serious charges. Uh, so we'll see what happens with uh, Josh Sills, formerly of West Virginia and Oklahoma State. Some of the uh, chat room from Hoops from the Hill. Sills finished his career at Oklahoma State, just so everyone knows, laugh out mm-hmm. loud. He transferred from West Virginia merely days after the alleged incident. And then uh, there was another comment or two about it uh, uh, from Wet Blanket. Allegedly it happened in 19. It's 2023. I don't understand any of this. As far as, as Paul mentioned, sometimes the legal system can take a long, long time. I did not hear anything, had no idea about the fact that he was involved in anything like that, whatever the truth might be. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody did. That's why it's four years after the fact. Uh, you know, obviously a lot of people didn't didn't know, but it is a, a headline now, and so he will be facing major uh, jail time, deservedly so, especially if you – you know, read the, the details of it. But uh, if you don't, totally understand that as well. Uh, but, yeah, just a, it's a, a real shame there. And uh, like I said, I hope that, you know, the victim involved is, is doing okay. Um, I saw you shaking your head at this, so I just assumed that you must have some thoughts on yeah, Hall no, of Fame I do. Man, that, that hits NFL me. executive Bobby Bethard, uh, dead at age 86, uh, three decades as an executive uh, in the NFL. Apparently, he was suffering from Alzheimer's disease and uh, passed away uh, earlier this week on Monday. Uh, but a 2018 Pro Football Hall of Fame inductee uh, in the contributor's role and a personnel exec for uh, teams including the Dolphins and Redskins when they were known as that still uh, back in their Super Bowl days. Uh, so he part of two Super Bowl franchises, uh, or to part of two franchises when they won Super Bowls in Miami and Washington. He, but uh, your thoughts on Bobby Beth? He was the director of player personnel when that Dolphins had their run, they the, their first Super Bowl, the unbeaten team in 72. He was there for a long time, for five or six years. And then he ended up taking over Washington and then was teamed up with Joe Gibbs. That was kind of like... He was Bernie Top and Joe Gibbs was Elton John, if, if mm-hmm. that makes sense yeah. in, in a way. Um, he left Washington in 1990. That was before they won their last Super Bowl in 1991, but he was a part of that run Washington had in the uh, late 80s and also in, Chargers, excuse me, too. for most of the uh, se- uh, late 80s, uh, throughout the year that Gibbs was there except a couple of them. I, and I the believe, Chargers, I yeah. believe he was the, when the Chargers went to the Super Bowl in with Stan Humphries as their quarterback. Stanley Richard the, and all yeah, them, yeah. He was the guy who built that. He's the guy who drafted Junior Seau. So. Dean Spano, uh, Spanos from the Chargers, he was one of the best judges of football talent in NFL history. Yep. Yep, so passing away from the awful disease that is Alzheimer's and uh, – Having at least lived a, what seemed like a long, fulfilling life. So there, there is that. But, uh, yeah, RIP to uh, Bobby Beathard. He's the one that drafted, uh, just to know, Art Monk, Daryl Green, who turned out to be unbelievable because he came out of A&I, Joe Jacoby, Monty Coleman, guys that were the like leaders of that great run the Redskins had. So, yeah, that's, that's, that, I saw that earlier, and I kinda, that hit, hit me because he was, he was fantastic. All right, uh, this is something that I don't feel like gets enough attention, but it, it rolls around every year of this time. And so the state of Tennessee, uh, <laughs> I, I think, actually has a good idea here. And there's a lot of just, like, garbage, like, bills and things that get thrown out there and goofy stuff. But a bill was filed for introduction on Wednesday by Tennessee Senator London Lamar and Representative Joe Towns Jr. Uh, proposed axing Columbus Day as a legal holiday in the state 
And so before you go like, oh, I, I don't know what people's feelings are on Columbus Day. <laughs> like, I really don't. And I don't even care, to be perfectly honest There's with you. whole episode of The Sopranos yeah, about like, it. I don't care what, what p- opinions are on it. I just, it's not about Columbus Day so much. It's about the, the great idea that would replace Columbus Day. And that is replacing Columbus Day with the first Monday after the Super Bowl as, as, a, as a holiday, so to speak. And uh, I, for one, am all for this. I feel like this is long overdue. I feel like we all love to get all set up for Super Bowl Sunday, and we drag our butts to work the following day after watching that 17-hour broadcast and the late finish, and we're, we're worse for wear. But what do you guys think about the new national holiday, uh, in theory, of Super Bowl Monday. I I support it completely. And look, as an Italian, I'm supposed to um, support Columbus Day wholeheartedly, although he wasn't working for Italy when he did that. Uh, He was working for Spain. Uh, So uh, he also didn't know where he was. He thought he was in India the whole time. He died thinking he was in India, uh, which may have helped if he had gone to India first so he knew what it looked like. Uh, But anyhow. So wait a minute. Um, the day after the Super Bowl is a national holiday. Absolutely. Don't we have too many of them? No. No. Why would we have too many holidays? It's not the Industrial well, we Revolution don't, anymore, We never smoking. get to actually enjoy exactly. 90% of them, no, so what so difference like, does it make? Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, there's not enough. Ne- look, there's not enough. And look, our world, I'll, eventually robots are going to do all our jobs anyway, so I, let's just get used to I'll some more this. times off. The times that I was able to actually be there at a Super Bowl – Go to the game. The day after the game is an absolute nightmare from where you are, no matter what city you are, to get back to where you live. And so that, I wish that would have happened 25 years ago. I mean, most places don't even acknowledge it really anyways. It's not necessarily an official take this day off holiday. Yeah. It's really like in the eye of the beholder. It's not like, you know, most of the federal holidays that you everybody takes off, even though we still don't do that here all, all the time. But... Uh, yeah, so it's not like you're replacing anything, really. Um, but, yeah, so that's that's been a thought for years and years and years, but it's just funny to see politicians actually, you know, move trying to move that ball forward a little bit. And I, I'd love it if we did that. You could enjoy the Super Bowl so much better, not having I to worry about so. going to work the next day. Yeah, because most and that's people more are getting American. lit up. Yeah. That's more American now than, than anything else, quite frankly. I mean, is if we're if we're being honest about it, celebrating the Super Bowl holiday is as American as anything right now. So how about either that day or the day that opens up the NCAA tournament, not the play in games with that. but the first round games on Thursday. Yeah, sure. Well I Both? I'm, I'm all for look, I'm all for all of it. Because like, no just, one's working on that day. No, I mean again, you can either fight lost pro- productivity. And, and str- swim upstream because now, um, you know, back before the internet and you could watch everything on your computer, what you'd have is people like taking long lunches or losing, like just, I, I think that we have as a country, we fight things that we're never going to win. Like, you know, if you're a boss and you're like, unless you have a business that's absolutely essential, like you can most days like, like that, just let it go and enjoy and rework your calendar. But yeah, I'm all for it. I, I think here's the other thing about Christopher Columbus, I'll say, is that he discovered somewhere where people were already living, by the way. So he didn't really Don't dis- tell me that. I mean, you knew that. There were people here. So he, aside of whatever happened after that, which was not good, but uh, he discovered something where people were already here that had already been discovered by people from Europe in just a different part of the country, and we are celebrating it, and he didn't even set foot of where we are right now. Okay, he was so in the islands the whole the time. The Mayflower didn't exist. No, the Mayflower it's existed. Not Christopher Columbus. That's not Christopher Columbus. That's a completely different thing that was 128 years he later. He landed in Ohio. No, he landed in the West Indies, which are called the West Indies because that idiot thought he was in freaking Indy. India. Hey, he's more <laughs> famous than you are. Yes, I know. You know it's not bad to yeah. be an idiot and famous, right? But he also, he I also, mean, you know, uh, committed I'll many that, atrocities after that in order to secure the land for Spain. Yes, yeah, so I wasn't trying to go down yeah. so much. Did the statue get taken down? Hey, it'd be okay. cool to yeah. be cool to have the Super Bowl Monday off. Yeah. So anyways, uh, tonight, East-West Shrine Bowl, for those who want to check that out, NFL Network, 715. Uh, you can uh, see the East-West Shrine Bowl. It's one of the last remaining All-Star games. And uh, there is a few things off the radar. All right, 507, Scott Drew around the corner with us. I got a note from Bob Thompson. 
He put up on questions again about the Pac-12 and all of what they're trying to do to find something new of how you can find them uh, and who's going to broadcast them. That and more. This is 365 Sports. Marco's Pizza. Pizza lovers get it. Five locations in the Waco area. Pretty much wherever you are, you can order a pizza, pick it up, or have them delivered to you. Obviously, the weather the last two or three days has affected some of that. Marco's Pizza is also looking for drivers. They're looking for people in management to run the stores and also be very much involved in what they do in the growth. And maybe one day you run your own pizza uh, uh, business. Bob Mock started in the pizza business. He delivered pizzas. He was a part of uh, running various stores, different brands back in the day or companies, and now he has his own in Marco's Pizza. One of the fastest, if not the fastest growing pizza franchise in America, and five locations here, four of them have opened up since I first met him. One in Belmead, one in China Spring, one in Hewitt, one also is in Woodway and also Robinson, and three of those are new within the last year or so. Marco's Pizza, Marco's Pizza, pizza lovers get it. The President's Day sales event is happening now at Allen Samuels in Waco. Shop the great selection of new cars, trucks, and SUVs and get amazing deals on new Ram trucks, Jeep SUVs, Chrysler sedans, and minivans, or a sporty Dodge. You get more for less, guaranteed, more value, more selection, more service, and more trade-in allowance. And of course, if we don't have exactly what you want in stock, we can help you build the custom car, truck, SUV, or van of your dreams and order it today. It's the President's Day sales event happening right now at Allen Samuels in Waco. You want to know why Stonewood Dental is so successful? Listen to what happy customers have to say. Pleasant. It's different than any other dentist's office. I really feel like they care. And it's not that you're here for two hours waiting on someone to take care of you. It's quick and easy, and, you know, I bring my kids, and my kids love being here, too. They really love the treasure box. <laughs> Staff is really nice and accommodating, real friendly. You feel more like home. It's not sterile looking. Everybody has their own personalized rooms with decorations and decor, and they'll even have a blanket for you when it's cold. <laughs> I've recommended people to actually come here, and they are patients now. I really love it here. It feels like family. Learn more, stonewood-dental.com. Shorty's Pizza Shack at 12th and Bagby is a homegrown, locally owned pizza place that's out of this world. Everything from the dough, the sauce, the sausage topping is made fresh in-house. Not to mention the amazing pizza pillows, the chicken wings are to die for, try the sick of sauce, chili cheese fries or tots, plus great specials on food and drink every single day. Shorty's is also the perfect spot to watch the game with your friends. Shorty's Pizza Shack at 12th and Bagby. Tell them Paul sent you by. TFNB Your Bank for Life is the official local bank of Baylor Athletics. Find out why more Central Texas are making TFNB their bank for life. Sign up for our Edge checking and savings accounts to earn interest or cash back. With five convenient locations and an award-winning mobile app, banking has never been easier. TFNB Your Bank for Life. Member FDIC. Hey, this is Bryce Petty, former starting quarterback and two-time Big 12 champion. And I know firsthand the importance of being in top shape both on and off the field. So listen up, men. If you're feeling beat down day in and day out and looking for that high-performance edge that separates the men from the boys, then look no further than the Petty Clinic Low T in Waco. Petty Clinic is a comprehensive men's health care clinic with an atmosphere catering to men. Board-certified Dr. Kent Petty has a special interest in offering the highest quality medical care to men of all ages. Some of the services offered include screening and treatment for low testosterone or thyroid, infertility, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, while offering comprehensive wellness exams and complete men's health lab panels. High performance men, remember, it's not just a petty thing. This is Bryce Petty, encouraging you to reach out and Google search Petty Clinic Low T or go to PettyClinicLowT.com and get your complimentary lab screening today. How did Edward Jones become one of the biggest financial service companies in the world? 
by not acting that way. Financial strategies, one-on-one advice, it's a big difference. And that's why Brad Wilson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, makes sense of investing. Experience the difference for yourself. Brad Wilson, 250 Sharon Drive in Woodway, 254-776-4337. Edward Jones, member SIPC. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. The 5 o'clock hour is brought to you by Edward Jones Investments and financial advisor Chuck Verno, who will navigate you through today's financial climate. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Now here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. Here we go, 365 Sports. Um, there was a tweet about Blue Bloods, and, and this is an argument we could have, and, and I say argument, this is a discussion that we could have every day on this show. We do a lot of college football. So leave that up for a little bit, Garrett, if you don't mind. This is from a guy, I don't even know who he was. I just happened to see it, and I, I, I said, okay, this is always a fun and can be a discussion where we all disagree and agree to disagree. So he put down three levels of blue bloods in college football. Absolutely, USC, Oklahoma, Texas, Michigan, Ohio State, Alabama, and Notre Dame. I would not argue against any of them being a college football blue blood, no matter the length of droughts and or what they are all at the very highest of where they are over the history of college football and even enough recency with most of them. I, I'm wondering what his his standards are for, for Blue Bloods. Is it like the consistency over time? Because, because if that's the case, then you've got to kind of maybe drop USC down a level. No. But, which you wouldn't. But, again, potentially, like, the three that are in potentially have three national titles, five national titles, and three national titles. So... That's more than Penn State has, and that's more than Tennessee has. So I would drop. Can we wait? Don't bring up the ones below them yet. Let's oh. just talk about them. There is you. You think that if there's an argument with any of the ones, it absolutely would be USC. I, um, no, 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 no. An argument. But I was asking what his standards are, and that's why okay. I would say that. So, but yeah, I don't think there's any. And absolutely, I'm not going to argue anybody. Okay, argue, but Craig. Well, it's clearly the off season. Right? <laughs> Blue, Blue Bloods talk. Well, we're yeah. a college football no, show I as know. well. Right? It's yeah, but it does just, just. I don't think it's changed much from last year, the year before, except for Georgia just keeps raising its stock. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that all of those are are yeah, those are those are fine where they are. Arguably, and this is interesting. Georgia now with a couple of national titles after going forty years without one. Florida State has won within the last ten years. Nebraska has not won since 1997, which is 25 years ago. They played for 1-0-1, and they shouldn't have. LSU has won under Saban and Les Miles and Ed Orgeron. Tennessee, now that's a drought because they didn't have the history of, for example, in that same group, Nebraska, at all. But they did win in 1998. Penn State used to be a part of that, absolutely. They've still been steady. They just haven't really threatened to win a national title, it seems like, in quite some time. Well, yeah, I don't I don't think I can talk about Penn State without talking about the other ones because I think, based on the ones below it, that Penn State is far behind all those schools. I don't know far, but they are, like, especially lately, really behind them all. Yeah, uh, you know, there, there's definitely some new blood and some old blood. Um but whether they're blue or not, that's that's the hard. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think it all just depends on your definition of blue blood, or your not even so much your definition, but your interpretation of what that means, because some might have a far more elite list that cuts it off at like ten, right? And then some, if you really want to, kind of like, okay, yeah, we can make it twenty, kind of like whatever this list was, it's three, seven, ten, thirteen, sixteen teams on this list. So yeah. Um, like Penn State's a blue blood in some ways, but like foot, I don't know. I, I I could I could hear arguments on either side for that one. All right, potentially, Florida had their run, winning in 1996 and then winning again under Urban Meyer twice, and part of the conversation for quite some time. Miami 
had a long, long run from 83 when they beat Nebraska until 2001 when they may have been the best team in the history of college football. But since that time, they've been hit and miss. Clemson was at 1981 or whatever. They won the national title. And then they went, they were kind of like Georgia. They were pretty good at times, but until Dabo got there, and then, of course, they've taken off in the last eight to ten years with him, and they've been winning two and then involved in a couple of others as far as right on the cusp of winning more. Yeah, I, I just think that those three have – they're outside of potentially and at least inarguably. Yeah. Now, yeah, I mean, so – Clemson's new to it, yeah. but – yeah, they but, are. Yeah, I mean, and, and Miami's old to it because it's been 22 years, but uh, even still, they've won five of them. So if you're basing everything on history because Michigan's in that, Notre Dame's in that, Tennessee's in that, and Penn State's in that, and Nebraska, then all three of those have to raise up to that other level. Okay, and again, this is just a tweet. I don't know what his mm -hmm. criteria was. It doesn't matter. It's always a great discussion. I'm going to go to the uh, chat room in a minute. Scott Drew joins us in about 10 minutes. In August of this past year, Sports Illustrated did a fan poll asking who were the bluest of the bloods in college football. Alabama was number one. Ohio State, two, Oklahoma, three, Notre Dame, four, Nebraska, five, Michigan, USC, and Texas. And I would look at that list, and it's a graphic in front of me. I would look at that list, and I would not kick any of them out, even though, go ahead and put the other tweet back up again, Garrett. Let's go over something. No, 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 that's not it. When was the last time USC won a national title? Oh, four? Yep. Yep. Oklahoma, 2000. Texas, 05. Michigan, 97. Mm -hmm. Ohio State would have been... 2014. 2014. Alabama, just name them. Notre Dame. 1987. 1988, 87 or 88, 88 with yeah. Lou Holtz. Yeah. Nebraska, 97. LSU's won a handful. Georgia's won the last two. Florida State, 13. Yep. Tennessee. 98. 98. Penn State. 80 something right 80 i don't i don't have them memorized it's been so yeah they beat miami non-factor in my life they beat miami when they intercepted a pass at the goal line when miami had the great run and i don't know if it was jimmy johnson so that would have been i think in the late 80s they won an 82 i think claimed national titles 82 and 86 86 is when they shocked vinnie testaverde yeah. in miami so they had a nice run and then Florida. Is that blue blood, though, like that's where I'm. Yeah. I'm kind of like that's what I mean. Is like that. I'm. I'm sort of on the fence with that. I mean, I, because there has to be a cutoff somewhere, and it's like, is the cutoff just you've won a national title? Is the cutoff you've won a couple of them? I mean, yeah, you won a couple of them, but it's like, okay, well then let's throw Princeton in there. They've won a bunch of yeah, national. Minnesota like, Minnesota back in yeah, Minnesota back in the day. Let's yeah. throw Minnesota. How's Yale doing in the blue blood? You know what I mean? Like that's where it's. That's why I think it's such a subjective argument. Is that everybody's probably going to have some sort of different criteria. And I tend to lean towards you don't have any doubt that you're starting to drop off the elite level. And then when I start to get into kind of like the tail end of this, I think you're still, I think this is a really solid list. Like if you were to go to 20 though, that's when you're really like starting to stretch it out. I think a bit. if in fact, Garrett, you get into this too. If you had to knock out two programs and it again, it could be none, but if you knocked out two from the absolutely arguably and potentially who would you knock off of that list? For me, I would replace mm, Tennessee with Miami. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, Penn State, they haven't – like, you just, I was one the last time they won a national championship. So, yeah, those two I would probably replace with Miami and – I don't know. Uh, definitely Miami and probably Florida. Clemson's got to be in the mix as well, but – all right, I'm going to give know. you my – if I had to – if I was forced to take two names off the list, which will create argument no matter who, they've been good. But I would – if I'm talking about Blue Bloods, I would take off Tennessee and Florida. Enjoy your DMs. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no. Tennis, uh, Tennessee might be back here in the middle. You know, it looks like they're going to do something with Heifel. But I'm, I'm talking – if I had to, I would take off as far as Blue Bloods and, again – I know that some of those schools, like, for example, Michigan 97, Nebraska, uh, Michigan 97 shared it with the. I would think they'll overall, 
you're looking at the last 25 to 40 years of college football, it's hard to take anybody off. But if I did, Tennessee, it's been a long, long, long drought for them. I, I also I think okay, you mentioned drought. I also think that the way I would measure it also on a blue blood is not only how many titles you won, but how often you're consistently in contention. Okay, well, Tennessee and Nebraska so, have almost the same resume. If you don't look ahead of that, 98 for Tennessee, 97 well, no, for Nebraska. Well, no, I mean, like, ahead of it does matter, too, because, like, the way you've built up your program, yeah. the history matters because you've got, like, Tennessee and Nebraska always have full stadiums, right? I right. mean, they're, they're still doing that in spite of those long droughts. So that's why, you know, you have to consider that. But I do think that one of the things, if you're going to take people off the list, is how long are your droughts throughout the periods? You know, so Miami wasn't doing anything. They were about to drop football. They hired Howard Sh Howard Schnellenberger and he changed the whole perception of it but since that time they've just been lost in the wilderness because they got behind especially on facilities but all the other like LSU is a great example of this they have been good in pretty much every era now they they've managed that so LSU to and me they fits played, that they played they won the national titles before they played for it in yeah. 1970 uh, and then of course they've had the great run since when Saban arrived I mean, uh, I'm dropping Penn State and Miami. Yeah, All right. um, I think that's the route, the route I'm going. You mentioned Tennessee; they've got a, they've got one more national title than Nebraska does. So, I mean, what? They've got six national titles. Okay, All right. I'm, I'm they talking. They have one more title than Nebraska does. I'd like so, to see how many of them are the ones that aren't just like Sagarin. Yeah. Uh, Florida. I mean, that's very new booty. Uh, that's yeah. very. I mean, they've won two since 2000, new and booty. without that, that's they won. The only other one was in '96 with Spurrier. So, I mean, they're – like, that's when, though, you start to get – like, you'll, you'll hear from longtime Florida fan or longtime insert school here, and you'll hear about the number of All-Americans that they have. <sighs> you know, and then you start – like, you can get into the – it's like, but longevity doesn't mean blue blood. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's where it also gets into is like, yeah, you have all that because you've been playing for 50 years longer yeah. than some other schools have, yeah. and so you have a built-in advantage – uh, and so, that's where Miami and Florida State don't because they had not been right. playing for as yeah. long. And so they, I think but, you have to wait that yeah. and consider that. But yeah, like if you if your if your argument is like, well, we have more All Americans or more All Conference guys, it's like, but you were in that for 50 years longer than okay. But like if we're doing national titles and Heisman Trophy winners, like that's a different argument. Uh, so yeah, I think again it's very subjective. I don't think there's 25 blue bloods in college football. And what again is the definition of blue blood? Because some people would just say, oh, well, it's like you recruit really well and you're just one of the it schools. And I don't think that that's a blue blood. I, I don't think it's just that you're a hot school and not like hot in the moment like Oregon. Oregon's not a blue blood. But like just a popular school. I don't think popularity means blue blood. But I feel like sometimes popularity inserts certain schools into the blue blood conversation, again, depending on who we're talking about making certain And when, when we're having this discussion. We're having the conversation. I might be wrong, but Tennessee has two – what are considered national titles. There's probably some on the others at AP or UPI, which, of course, changed but some of their names I, in 1951 and 1988. Now, claimed national titles, 38, 40, 50, 51, 67, and 98. Tennessee claims six national they titles. They can claim them. Like, USC might claim 20, but the AP and or UPI is the one that are the national That's subjective. Titles. Yeah. I mean, it honestly is that because other people don't agree because they hang banners saying these are the national championships. Uh, granted, they're doing that for recruiting or just to put more banners up, but there's not like a rule that, oh, no, you're only allowed to count so-and-so. No, 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 there is a rule. The AP national title was what it was forever. That was the only one, and then the UPI started one, and those are the ones that are considered, and then, of course, it became the BCS and then the college football playoff. Those are the ones that are the real national titles that's based on college football history okay well inform a and m and everybody else who's put yeah. up banners there's well, a, a ton of schools one. yeah oklahoma state's claimed other like i mean oklahoma state's claimed the title a and m's claimed the title that's what i'm saying auburn's i saw an Ar Ar auburn fan arguing of how they could collect like four more unclaimed national titles and so that's all i'm telling you is you can take it how you want to but again that's subjective because yes that should be the rule but schools themselves claim more than yeah. they actually have UCF? because it's yeah like yeah ucf claims but a national a title a m had to take what look a m has one national title it's 1939 right that's it that was the national title um i believe dana x bible was the coach that was when they won they were really good in 1957 when bear bryant was there but they weren't national champions they didn't win the ap but uh, and then after that they've had no other team 
All right. Technically. Here, here's Oklahoma has seven national championships. The ones that were the AP and or bowl championship series, their last one. In addition to these seven national titles that are acknowledged, there are 10 additional years in which the NCAA official record books, for example, math rating systems, Sagarin, Dunkel Index, or whatever. I have never thought of those. And that's not just because I just have, ne I have always thought the national title, you can claim a lot of them. Okay, I get it. 2017 UCF or whatever it was. Um, but okay, I, all and so right. I'm not telling you you're right or wrong. I agree with you that there should be a cutoff. But what I'm telling you is, is that the numbers that you're working with, and you say no, they've only got two. Well, then that you'll get argued till you're blue in the face okay, over right. I can argue, over and, what's claimed. You know, and I will. Yeah. For example, and I know Scott Drew's next. Oklahoma does not acknowledge these additional championships as they were not awarded by the Associated Press, the UPI, and eventually what became the USA Today coaches poll, or what is the bowl championship series. So there might be 10 other ones, and Tennessee might have four or five other ones, and I'll wait for my DMs to blow up. All right, it was just a discussion, and let me, I thought went pretty good. Real quickly, before we get to Scott Drew, um, drop Clemson. Hmm. Bump Florida and Miami up. Florida and Miami have to be a part of it. Michael DeHart. Nebraska, Florida State, and Penn State are close to losing their big boy club badges. Now, Florida State did win in the last. Uh, Paul, you're biased, and so yeah, am I. But still, uh, knock out Notre Dame and Nebraska. I can't ever knock out Notre Dame. You know, though. Yeah, I yeah. can't. I, don't I mean, think you can you knock can out ever. Nebraska probably at some point in time. Not right now, but you're you're like Notre Dame's forever perched there. I mean, they just. They, whether that's right, wrong, or otherwise, I mean, they're they're they have their own TV deal, they, yeah, man. I mean, like it's just I mean, they're they're not going to get bumped. They're yeah. just they're not um, in any scenario unless it's a fantasy scenario. The, the Big Ten expanding, and there's all these schools that would line up to do it, and the only school they've got to go beg, the only one, yeah. Notre Dame. Scott Drew is next on 365 Sports. The future's bright. The time is now. Destiny is calling. Can you hear the sound? This isn't just another song. This is the soundtrack of life at Baylor. There's a spark in your heart and a fire that's in your eyes. If you're ready to take a big step toward a bright future, tap the banner below to check out the music video for a glimpse of life at Baylor University. We will Where lights shine bright. When we moved to Texas, we were like fish out of water. We didn't know anyone in our neighborhood until our Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent came to the house. She was so helpful and reassuring, a friendly face with that Texan hospitality I'd heard about. When we purchased a Texas Farm Bureau insurance policy, we knew we were making the right choice. We knew our family would be protected. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Waco Custom Marketplace is your hometown grocery store with a full-service butcher shop and baker. Hi, this is David Smoke. The butcher shop can take your customized orders for seafood, pork, and poultry and custom cut your favorite steaks from bacon wrap fillets to T-bone to bone and ribeyes. Cut specifically the way you want. They have Norwegian salmon fillets, catfish fillets, sliced ham or turkey and lunch meat, variety of cheese available, and several options of sausage links. Fresh chicken breast or whole chickens, sliced bacon, pork chops, ground beef, marinated beef and chicken fajitas, and always large briskets available, plus fresh vegetables. So the great product, customer service, and family tradition of the Bauer family continues at Waco Custom Marketplace, open Monday through Saturday. A full-service butcher shop and bakery available. Waco Custom Marketplace, 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco, or WacoCustomMarketplace.com. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, the team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike, whether it's knee or shoulder pain, hand or wrist injury, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trusts. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, wants to get you back in the game. 
Camille Johnson Realtors guide you seamlessly through the process of buying your dream home or selling your current one. Commercial, farm and ranch, or residential, Camille Johnson Realtors can smoothly and successfully lead you through any transaction. With a team of 28 experienced agents who are excited about serving you, Camille Johnson Realtors services the entire greater Waco area. If you're in the market to buy or sell, contact Camille Johnson Realtors, 104 Midway Center in Woodway, or find them online at www.camillejohnson.com. Camille Johnson Realtors, elegant, charming, warm. Welcome home. Pizza, burgers, and Bears football. There's no place around Waco that serves them all other than Bubba's 33. Come show your green and gold and enjoy some of Waco's best food and beverages while watching your favorite team, the Bears. When real Bears fans get hungry, Bubba's 33 is the number one spot for ice-cold drinks, hand-stretched, stone-baked pizzas, and bacon-infused burgers. Join us for indoor or patio dining. Bubba's 33, Waco's restaurant and proud supporter of Baylor Bears football. Sick em, Bears. This is 365 Sports. Are you a Sikkim 365 super fan? Then try out our premium subscriptions at Sikkim365.com. Here we go, 365 Sports. Paul Catalina, Craig Smoke, David Smoke, National Championship basketball coach Scott Drew of Baylor joins us here on the show with a game coming up Saturday against Texas Tech. How have the players reacted to Monday night in Austin? Well, you know, uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, we got a bunch of guys that don't like losing, so uh, no one was happy. Uh, and at the same time, I think uh, having a couple days to practice now, um, we definitely have found some areas we can improve. Last time we lost three in a row, we were able to really uh, take a step forward as a team. Hopefully we don't have to lose three in a row to do the same, but um, and I know uh, uh, we've identified areas we got to get better in, and hopefully we can do that now for the second half of the conference. Scott, how do you judge the first practice after a loss? Like, what do you look for when you want to see the guys come out there? You said they don't like losing. Do you have, like, a mental checklist of, like, I want to see how they respond the next time we get out on the floor? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really uh, um, usually you're coming off a day off if it's uh, uh, a big Monday game. So, uh, usually you have a film session. Uh, if, if you won, it would be a more enjoyable film session because uh, we always rather learn after wins rather than losses. Um, but after that, uh, the important thing is do the players um, take what was, was shown in film and try to improve those areas. And uh, we were able to do that, and that practice, uh, uh, to me, uh, was a win whenever you can take what you – identify areas we need to work on we need to improve always starts with the coaches we got to put them through reps and practice what we want and then it's up to them to carry that out and i thought uh we did that well yesterday um today wasn't as good a practice as yesterday but uh um you deal with 18 to 22 year olds usually uh, you don't get a bunch of great ones in a row Scott, can you uh, try and explain just the difficulty of that turnaround into Big Monday, going from playing Kansas, a top ten team, the the grind and the fight with Arkansas, and then having to, you know, basically just catch your breath and go right into to going and playing in Austin? Is how how difficult is that having that crowded schedule and turnaround? Well, I, I know uh, we have a top five toughest schedule on the net on, on uh, the net analytics. We have the second most, I, I don't know where it's at now, but the second most quad one win. And when you play those uh, hard-fought games, it can beat you up mentally and physically. But at the same time, that's why uh, uh, the players come to Baylor because they want to play against the best. They want to be the best. They want to beat the best. Um, so you're able to do that and have that opportunity each and every night in the Big 12. And that's why, uh, quite frankly, the, the home court advantage is so critical because – on nights where you're a little flat, the home fans really give you that lift. And I thought uh, uh, Texas had an emotional game at Tennessee, and their crowd did a great job giving them a lift on Monday night. And that's why it's really hard to win on the road in the Big 12. When I first met you in your office and sat down and interviewed you, and you had the dream of having home court advantage, and you mentioned like Hilton Coliseum or other places – Bramwich and obviously what's Allen Fieldhouse. It, it's not that way every game, but this year it does seem as if, or there has been because of your success. Do you feel like you're getting closer to that? 
100%. I think uh, uh, marketing and, and the Baylor people uh, have done a uh, uh, Michaela and her group, and Aaron Bean and Noah, have done a great job with fan involvement. Our fans are involved; they have fun. Um, the atmosphere is so much so much better. Uh, uh, it's obviously a lot uh, louder. Um, so I think I think all that has been a big lift and been a, a big blessing and a big help and support. At the same time, the, the new pavilion just takes that to another level, and um, I think it's the difference in eating hamburger and eating the difference of filet mignon. I mean, <laughs> uh, Tex, Texas uh, uh, place was rocking on a couple big games, but that small environment's rocking every game, you know, and um, that's what the pavilion will be louder, more interactive. Um, I know the media will be happy because uh, Wi-Fi reception will be a lot better. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, it, 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 it's just going it, to – it's been good this year. Um, it'll be even better next year. Scott, Jalen Bridges, since that West Virginia game, when he, he broke out of his funk, it seemed to, to me, at least from the outside, that he was kind of letting his offensive slump kind of affect his whole game. But since that point, just the way he's contributed to your team in every which way that he can, it's been unbelievable. Yeah, I tell, I tell you, Jalen, uh, a lot of people look at his shooting percentage, but uh, really uh, his, his rebounding numbers have been terrific. His, uh, he takes care of the ball, his assist turnovers. Uh, we'd like more assists, but he's a low turnover guy. He shoots free throws. And his defense has really, really improved. I know a lot of times we talk about how hard it is for freshmen to come in and learn the college system and whatnot. But it's also hard for transfers because um, Coach Huggins is a great coach, but their defensive philosophy uh, was completely opposite in ours in a lot of areas. So if you do something for several years and now all of a sudden you say, hey, we're not going to do this, we're going to do that, that takes time to uh, adapt to as well. And I think he's done a great job uh, uh, adapting. Scott, uh, Keontae George is obviously a dynamic player. Uh, the, the shot selection with the clock underneath 20 seconds, that's a shot if he makes it, no one blinks. Uh, that seemed, at least from my perspective, he was hot, but it seemed like that you could have gotten a better shot. How do you handle that moment? Well, it, that that is a head coach. First thing is, what could I have done better? And I should have called timeout. So um, I kicked myself for not doing that. Uh, and in the future, um, we'll be better prepared if we don't have a timeout. And if we do have a timeout, uh, we'll be prepared as well. So uh, a lot of times you don't know until you know. And uh, sometimes we all know at the same time. Isn't How that one of those things that makes him who he is, though, that he's not – he knows that, that that he wanted that shot, and sometimes he's going to make it. Yeah, that 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 that's such a fine line in in coaching, and uh, you never want to take the aggressive, uh, uh, confident behavior away. Uh, at the same time, as a coach, you want to educate. And mm -hmm. um, our job is we have we have great scores, we have great shooters. If we get them great shots, their numbers are great. If we don't get them great shots or they take bad shots, their numbers not, aren't as good. So um, that's the give and take. Uh, Deontay has a knack for making big shots. And uh, the question is, in, in 20 seconds, if we'd have called timeout, could we have gotten him a better look than that and given him a better chance to make it? That's the question, you know? So, but the fact that, that, that he has uh, um, uh, a desire to take game-winning shots and he has a great ability to make them. He's made more than he's missed in practice. So we all have confidence in him. Um, I guess the key for all of us moving forward is each and every game we want to be better at what we do. Um, the best three-point shooters usually make 40, 45% of their shots. So uh, you're going to miss 55 out of 100. Um, better have people in rebounding position to get those. Is it – one of the hardest things in co maybe in all of sports, but in that situation, 20 seconds, one timeout to make the decision when to use those. Cause you're also judging, okay, is, is the, is the team we're playing against, you know, could we get them back on their heels? If we don't, if we just run all those decisions you have to make, you only get four in the game and only get three in the second half. And those ones in the last minute seem to be, that's a tough decision to make. And, and that's, that's where, uh, again, um, in a perfect world, you're playing uh, guys that have that have been in the program for three and four and five years because they have more experience in that, you know. And when you play when you play freshmen, 
Um, sometimes they don't have as much experience. Doesn't mean they can't be successful in it, but like uh, 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 someone that's a junior or senior maybe has been in that 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 situation before. And that's why in coaching, I think you have to identify what's best for your team at the particular time. So, I mean, if Deontay hits that and you save a timeout, and mm-hmm. even if Texas scores or doesn't score, it's great to have that timeout. Um, if you could have gotten a better look and uh, uh, scored off of that, then obviously it's better to have called timeout. I know it didn't work, so uh, the alternative would have de- definitely been better. <laughs> <laughs> no no question. And, and again, uh, he might make that next time, and, and you win a big game somewhere at home or not. Texas Tech picked up their first win. They were dead and buried, 0-8, and, and still have a big hole to come out of, and they're down 23 against a really good team and won. What did you see they did differently? I know they started pressuring the ball in the backcourt a little bit. Well, it, it, if, if you look at it, they've had two wins in a row now, and they've been shorthanded in both. I think they've really rallied. They won on the road in the SEC Challenge. It's never easy to win on the road. And now they win for the Big 12 at LSU, and then um, Iowa State was in first place in conference, and uh, they ended up beating them. So that's why our league is so good is because top to bottom, everybody's good. And you saw what Oklahoma did to Alabama. And, uh, if you're not ready to play, anybody can win any each uh, uh, and every night. What Texas Tech's done because of the injuries is they've had some guys step up and they've played better. And uh, they did. They were down 21 with about 10, 11 to go. So they did pressure it more. Um, but at the end of the day, they're they're playing good basketball right now. The last two games, Scott, they're taking more. care of the ball. Yep. they're making good shots. So, when do sorry, you? When, uh, I think we lost you. Disconnect. I'm sorry I interrupted you. The, oh. when, do you feel like you've got more leeway these days with officials than you had because you won a national championship or not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, at, at the end of the day, we officiate every day in practice. So we understand how tough officiating is. And we're glad we don't do it for a living. Um, at the same time, The Big 12 does have the best officials. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because in the NCAA tournament, um, we have more, and they advance further than the other leagues. So um, coaches would always like more calls. um, But I I do feel that that we do have uh, the best officials in the business. And over time, you learn to communicate with them better. I mean, 20 years, hopefully you communicate better with your wife, you know, and same thing with officials. And I'm not I, – I, we, we make mistakes. They make mistakes. Um, it's not a perfect game. Um, but at the end of the day, I think uh, uh, working with people longer is definitely more beneficial. But a, a, a louder crowd, a more engaged crowd, can affect those human beings who wear the stripes, correct? Most definitely. Yep. So I, I give you a perfect example. Until officials are robotic and not human – Crowds will have an impact, and, <laughs> and and they have a lot more impact than coaches. So the better our crowd, the less I got to do. <laughs> the Big 12 meetings are going on right now, and Gonzaga has been brought up as possibly something that they're discussing. Have you had any conversations with Mac about that? Well, the great thing is Mac is somebody that I, I really trust. He asks for opinions when he wants it. Um, I know when their name first got brought up, we talked about it. But um, after that, the good thing is uh, Max the best at his job. He lets me worry about our team and coaching basketball this time of year. Mm-hmm. And you know what? That's enough to keep us busy. <laughs> thank you, Coach. Appreciate your time. We'll see you Saturday. Hey, thank you, guys. Appreciate you. That's Scott Drew, Baylor men's basketball coach on 365 Sports. Uh, his former assistant got a technical foul at Allen Fieldhouse, and he after the game was discussing it. Was both teams shot 35 and 36 free throws? The, the fouls were very identical, but Jerome was saying it's the timing of the calls that can make a difference. Oh, Even though in the end they both shot 35 or 36 free I, throws, which is too many, by the way. I I still will wonder how deep that for Scott and Jerome in particular, two of the nicest. Uh, especially like not cussing people I've ever encountered, how dig they have to deep or what they have to say to get that T. Um, like you know. what Musselman said? Oh, well, no, I don't think it was that bad. Musselman's was so bad, like everyone stopped. Yeah, like while, 
Let's try, I mean, the, I need to find it. We need to find it and clip <laughs> it and make a, a, a GIF of it or GIF, whatever you want to call it. But Keontae George is about to shoot his free throw, and the three guys on this side, or the two or three guys on, on one side and of the lane, of the lane, and he. Like, they all turned around, the ones with their backs to him, all turned around, and Keontae, like, yeah. looked, oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> all right, uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes a, a technical foul may work a little bit later on in the game. When we come back, Paul Catalina's top five. Cars, price, right, both day and night. Average your car in Texas. Trucks built for you, red, white, and blue. Average your car in Texas. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be a part of the Waco community. We're a small family business right here in Central Texas, and our goal is to bring down the cost of health care while maintaining high quality. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. That's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through the difficult time. We offer premium MRIs just like a hospital with state-of-the-art technology and specialists. But you'll pay less, sometimes thousands of dollars less, whether you're using insurance or not. At Ideal MRI, we accept most insurance and there are no hidden costs. Even offering financing if that's needed, everything included in the price, and you'll not get some Something as a surprise in the mail later on. If you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. They'll know. You can schedule an appointment safely from home online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or give us a call, 833-IDEAL-MRI, IdealMRI.com. There are 26 letters in the alphabet, over 600,000 words in the dictionary, and just three of them said together can change everything. Let's order pizza. Those three words lead to dough made from scratch and three fresh signature cheeses that blanket golden crust in a heavenly melt on Marco's Pizza that'll blow your mind. So visit Marco's.com to order and stop by Marco's Pizza in Bellmead, China Spring, Woodway, and in Robinson. Marco's. Pizza lovers get it. Hi, this is Paul Catalina. I recently got engaged to the love of my life, but the most important thing that I had to do before I popped the question was get that perfect ring. And I know nothing about rings. So I went to the wedding ring store, Boozer's Jewelers on Valley Mills Drive. I knew I needed a custom design, and that's exactly what they do. Nine out of ten of their engagement rings are designed in-house. The entire process took less than a month, and they were great every step of the way. Great options on financing, excellent selection, and talented designers. My fiance and I get non-stop compliments on the ring. I only deserve credit for doing the smartest thing I could, walking into boozers and letting them work their magic. Your one-of-a-kind fiancé deserves a one-of-a-kind ring, and that's what you get at Boozers. Boozers Jewelers, the wedding ring store on Valley Mills Drive. One size fits all. That may be all right for an adjustable belt or cheap sunglasses, but when it comes to your financial needs, no one wants a one size fits all strategy. Ben Erlinson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, knows that his most important goals are yours. That's why he takes the time to understand your needs, knowing you. That's how Edward Jones makes sense of investing. Ben Erlinson, 100 North 6th Street in Waco, 254 759 8533. Edward Jones, member SI. PC. This is Paul Catalina's top five at 545. Or is it 555? Either way, it's the top five. Top five games missing from the Big 12 schedule. A lot of these have been by request. A lot of people have asked me to do a lot of schedule type top fives this week so i'm gonna i'm gonna do them and then tomorrow might be the top five best games on it or um i can't remember i gotta look at the, the exact topic number five and i realize that we've had this game two years in a row just a little bummed that we have this one-off schedule that it seemed to be building into a rivalry and you know we don't know how often it's going to happen or how the the actual new model is going to work exactly but i am a little bummed that baylor versus byu is not on yep. the schedule this year because it was building and had two games. You know, they split over the years at their home stadium. Would like to see that one going on 
another year. I realize that it's only a one-off thing, but I did think it was a bummer because I thought that one was kind of growing into something, and it still could. It's just we have to wait a year on it. Yeah, I mean, I think that if they were trying to establish new rivalries, that it was a missed opportunity because they could have just claimed this one right out of the gates. Uh, so maybe they have plans elsewhere, or maybe there are just too many other things on the checklist to have to, you know, check off before getting to, you know, the interest level in, in building a rivalry. But they're going to have to have those moving forward. They're going to have to have those as much as they have had the old rivalries. Mm -hmm. And they can't lean on – bedlam anymore and they can't lean on the red river shootout and they can't lean on all those things so yeah you're gonna need some new rivalries because just like you know tech baylor's not gonna i mean that could be a headliner for you um could be a headliner for you next year but you know you're gonna need more than that so yeah i think baylor byu is just kind of a natural that could have just blended right in after playing these last two seasons but uh, i understand you can't you got to eliminate somewhere, and maybe the thought process was, well, they've just played. Why play them a third time as opposed to the way that we're thinking about it, which is continue playing. So, yeah, um, we'll see. Maybe they're back next year, and if not, then I think that will be really puzzling if they're not on each other's schedule in uh, 2024. I would think that if they're not in 2024. It's because Texas and OU are still in the league. Yeah, and probably. They, they have to work out 14 teams. But uh, number four, UCF versus Texas. Now, if I had to pick – the second place of the new schools that I would like to see Texas go into. It would not have been BYU because we've seen them do that before. It actually would have been UCF. I would like to see the University of Texas play a road game in the state of Florida. And I know that they will eventually because they're going to go play the chomp chomps. And that'll be, uh, that'll be a, a great watch. Um, I mean, for everybody in the world, but me, but it'll still be a great watch. They have played each other. Oh. I, I was talking about now, like this year. Okay. Like I would okay. like to see them go into the bounce house and play there. That would have been my second one of the new ones after Houston. A little bummed that this one wasn't on there because I do think that um, John Rice Plumley and, you know, Quinn Ewers and that whole quarterback battle would have been interesting building up to it. Plus, uh, you know, UCF getting to play one of the, the teams that's going away, like the, the big brand of it. I know they guess they're playing Oklahoma, but getting to play Texas, to me, that Florida versus Texas thing, uh, especially Texas, the University of, was would really be interesting to me. To me, I think it's a bummer, a little bit of a bummer that they're not on the schedule. Oh seven, they played in Orlando. I know you're talking about now. Oh yeah. seven, they played in Orlando in a shootout, 35-32, and then they went back to DKR in 2009 in Texas smoked George Larry and UCF 35 to three. It's been a while. Yeah. So I just would have liked to see that one. I mean, again, if they're going to do one offs, this was one, the one offs I would have liked to see. Yeah. I mean, it would have been a cool matchup. Um, you know, it would have made a lot of sense, but you know, obviously some had to fall to the wayside. So, um, yeah, I think if you're looking to who probably could have given the most trouble, it might've been UCF. I mean, as far as the, the first year schools go, and again, that can be debated and, and whatnot, but I do feel like they're the one coming in the strongest uh, at the moment. So, yeah, uh, Texas in the bounce house would have been interesting. Yeah. Number three, Kansas State versus Oklahoma. No. Uh, here's, and, and oh, look, you don't want this one. No, I'm just, I, if uh, I'm, I, and maybe I'm, I'm not speaking for OU fans, but if I was an OU fan, I would want to, before I left and didn't play them for a while, cleanse my palate. And if I'm Kansas State, I want to beat them again. So yep. this to me is disappointing for both sides because there's a chance that the last thing that Kansas State did to Oklahoma was run right over them. And I don't want that if I'm Oklahoma. I would like to be able to go out and say, listen, our old Big 8 brethren, um, I know that you beat me the second to last time, but the last time we played, I got you. And if I'm Kansas State, I want the inverse of that to say, the reason you left is you were afraid of us. That's what I would like. Neither of them really matter in the long run of things. Just as fan trash talk and cross speak goes, I would I would personally like that. Over 100 times in 77, 22, and 4. But I would love to see one, two, three, about eight of the last maybe, I don't know, 20 games. Kansas State won plus a cup, one of them for the Big 12 championship. All the other wins for Kansas State were back in the – 20s and 30s so hmm. it may be one or two in the 60s when they had a pretty Lynn Dickey at quarter yeah I, I don't think anybody's bragging about when you know you could you knew people who didn't have electricity well, when Bill Snyder when was won. there they started yeah. winning consistently that was when OU was down as much as they've ever been down so that was a but the 2003 big 12 yeah. big 12 championship but, 
it comes into mind. Yeah. yeah, those those wins in the 20s and 30s when you could literally say like, oh, we can't go to David's house. He doesn't have electricity. Yeah. Like we could say that yeah. and nobody would be surprised. Yeah. Yeah, that, that to me. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. And Craig, I don't mean to speak for OU fans, but for me, I'd want to get them on the way out if I could. Yeah, I mean, it would have been nice to, uh, to see K-State on the schedule. Others might disagree and think that it's great that they're not because mm -hmm. maybe that's a loss that you avoid because, you know, I think K-State's feeling is they'll be pretty good again next year, but I know Oklahoma fans think that they'll be much better next year. So, yeah, that could have made for a great little clash, and this is one of the ones I'm kind of left, left scratching my head about is I don't know how this one's not on there. Um, I, I really don't. This would have been one of the, t the top ones in my mind. Uh, not that it's like one of the top rivalries per se, but I think in the history of the Big 12. Big 8. Yeah. In the Big 8. I mean, yeah, I think this is a missed opportunity. This could have been a really great game. Um, but, you know, again, something had to had to go. So, maybe, so maybe, be it. Maybe they'll play in the title game. That's yeah, the maybe. Only, that's the only hope you get. Number two, Texas versus Oklahoma State. Yep. Uh, Oklahoma State doesn't have to come to Texas but one time. They're going to, to Houston. Uh, this is one just – would have liked to see. I always thought, uh, especially lately, it's been a pretty good game between the two of them, and and uh, this is one of the ones we're not getting. There's there's a lot, but I mean this one in particular, um, you know, just it's just over, and that's it. Yeah, they've had some pretty good clashes. Uh, you know, Oklahoma State. Uh, you take away that that game for Texas this year, and I mean that looks wildly different. Mm -hmm. You know, their their season. So Oklahoma State's definitely been a little bee in their bonnet at, at different times, and, and Texas likewise has as well. But yeah, I mean Gundy and company have been super competitive for, gosh, going on decade plus, and uh, they've been as probably problematic for texas i mean in comparison to others as anybody uh, outside of oklahoma i would think i mean i know tcu's had their success but it just hasn't been as long um but i guess you throw tcu up there with oklahoma um and outside of that i would think oklahoma state's probably giving them the most fits and maybe i'm slightly off on that i'm not you know tend to be a historian or anything but yeah, these have usually made for some pretty good games, and Oklahoma State, more often than not, has been ranked or, you know, sniffing the, the rankings. So, um, yeah, highly competitive game that, uh, yeah, is not going to be um, on the schedule anymore, which is just kind of weird to get used to that. But, yeah, I, I think this is one that was, was a good one while it lasted. Oklahoma State has won nine of the last 14. There was a time when they couldn't sniff Oklahoma. But, you know, back in the day when Vince Young was at Texas, there were a couple of games against Oklahoma State where Oklahoma State – had them dead and buried yep. and just could not oh. breathe in the oh. second half. The Like, the, just the, hyperventilating. Do you remember the 05 game yes. where Vince Young – Vince yes. Young – job? Yes, I do. Vince Young just said, oh, this is going to be fun now. <laughs> oh, and they, and they, they smoked uh, Oklahoma State throughout most of the yeah. 2000s. But, yeah, the yeah. last 13, I think it's 9-4 and four or close yeah. to that number. They, look – USC fans should be furious with Oklahoma State for that because if they held on, yeah. then the legend of Vince Young running in that touchdown never happens because mm -hmm. they would have lost that game. And number one. By the way, they got outscored 35 to nothing yep. in that second half. Yeah. That's, that, that's why I say choke job. I mean, yeah. like it, oh, it was. 35 to nothing in the so second they were half. Up 30, they were up 28 to 12. Yeah. And Texas, then Vince took off. and that, Texas was playing very poorly. Yeah. Very poorly in the first it's half. The greatness of Vince Young, though. I mean, that's yeah. why that team ended up where they ended up. So yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the journey. But yeah, that's that's one that you wish you had back for sure. That changes a lot of history too. Yeah. And number one, the game that was the Big Twelveiest of all the Big Twelve games ever, <laughs> Texas Tech versus Oklahoma. The game that's given the Big Twelve this reputation of the league that doesn't that not gave it to it, but solidified even though it's not necessarily the truth any, or not the truth at all anymore. The league that never plays defense and doesn't care about it, the Texas Tech OU game uh, is not going to be played. That's 1 billion yards and 1 billion points and whatever they did with Mahomes and Mayfield that day. That game, it's just not going to happen this year. It's off to the wayside. I mean, hell, last year's game was yeah, wild. Yeah, exactly. Dylan last Gabriel year's... gets knocked out and start at the very beginning of overtime. Yep. I mean, it was. Oh, yeah, that's right on the little flea flicker, the throwback. Yeah, or yeah whatever that, that was. brilliant yeah. play call. Yeah. yeah. So Oklahoma. Let's, let's put our, hey, it's overtime, guys. This incredible game. Let's put our quarterback in danger to start <laughs> this bad boy off. How about that? The two or three most famous knowing, games. Knowing our backup situation after the <laughs> Texas game. Yeah, that was a. That was was the game in 08, mm -hmm. right? Because Oklahoma smoked them at the end that allowed them to move ahead of everybody and get in the playoff, the championship. And then, of course, the game with Mahomes and Mayfield 
where it was 66 59. Mm -hmm. I think my favorite was when Mike Leach and Graham Harrell and Michael Crabtree had beaten Texas, and they just needed to win a couple more to get to the national championship, and they had to roll into Oklahoma, and Bob Stoops and company proceeded to beat the ever-living mess out of them. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. um, 65-21, Craig. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know. I I watched that that entire thing, and I watched the the just blank – expressions on the faces of the late Mike Leach and Graham Harrell as they just had they went from the the penthouse to the outhouse real quick I mean that that, that feeling at least of having beat Texas and all the emotions with the crab tree catch and everything and feeling like man we're almost there like you can see the finish line and not only did they get beat which is fine you got beat out of Oklahoma but you got beat so badly that when there was a three-way tie to trying to determine who would be the big 12 champion you were like the distant afterthought, even though you'd beat Texas because you got beat so badly by Oklahoma that you you didn't have a chance to no. get the nod. You, you no. know the uh, that brought out. I think that 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 triumvirate there, of course, brought out the new you know Big 12s you know title game. policy and title game and all that. But that game as well um, brought out the uh, I think exposed some of the problems with the BCS where. You had coaches like Mac Brown, a universally beloved guy. I think one of the biggest knocks on him nationally was during that time, and he was just straight up publicly lobbying. It just wasn't a good look. It was the only thing he could do, mm-hmm. but it just didn't. It, it was a great look for his fans, but I it wasn't a good he, look. Around, like, and it, it's not a good look for just the profession or, or the situation where you as a coach, and it, it pro- it's, it's one of the things that's led us to where we are now, expanding to 12 teams in the playoff, in that – you as a coach should not really have to get up and no. you know lobby for why you deserve to be there in a sport because in sports the way you deser- show you deserve to be there is playing and not you know you know in the Olympics the guy who you know is in the discus throw doesn't go in and say like here's why I should be in the discus he earns his way there you know yeah, those no, kind of things yes, there's a number yeah there's a number yeah that 2008 then Oklahoma turned around and just crushed Missouri. 62-21 after that. Oklahoma got the nod. Texas lost simply just uh, by the Crabtree catch. Yeah, and outside mm-hmm. of that, Absolutely. that kept them out of the national title game. Yep, they would have beat an, Oklahoma. It would have been an 08 and 09 most yeah, likely. So, yeah, so, I mean, that's that's one that Texas fans will still tell you to this day. Some, at least the ones I know, will tell you, like, they should have been the rightful champs and, you know, could have won a national title and very well could have. But, yeah, that just that crazy, insane Crabtree play – um that that's that was an all-timer there but uh yeah that's uh that's a few there's there's obviously many more that you could probably have gone with but yeah we're going to be missing out on some pretty fun little rivalries that maybe we didn't appreciate enough at the time the big 12 is not going to see anymore big 12 has ruined a lot of pretty good rivalries along the years over Mm -hmm. very many things thank you to everybody the chat room the text line michael campbell big notre dame fan was like uh what is uh what's his name reese what give me his top five games He wasn't a big fan of Brian Kelly as well, who did a pretty good job at LSU. Michael, always great to hear from you from the Notre Dame perspective. Garrett Ross, thank you. Appreciate Craig Smoke and Paul Catalina, our amazing sponsors. Back at it again tomorrow at 3 o'clock. I'm David Smoke. Please stay warm, dry, and, well, we'll be back in a little less than 24 hours. This is 365 Sports.